Welcome to another episode of Morelia Python Radio, and this is a good one. Mark Higger reached out to me a few weeks back, and he, he had pitched a show idea about clearing up some of the confusion that happens between the two worlds of Morelia, carpet pythons and green tree pythons. It all started with the episode that we did with Francis Pringle, a.k.a. The Other Buddy. In that episode, we were a bit rough on him, and so Mark wanted to talk to us about some of the topics that were brought up in that episode. We had a great time talking with Mark, and it was refreshing to have a conversation bringing up controversial topics that we agree or don't agree on and still have a great discussion and still, at the end, leave it as friends. It was a great time talking with Mark. I hope you enjoy. Let's get into the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Morality Python Radio. This is episode 487. And in this episode, we are talking to Mark Hager. And we're going to be talking about demystifying chondros and how similar some of the terms that they use are similar to carpet python lingo we're trying to branch well, to two worlds they're they're similar to carpet python lingo more so than you and i believe and um we we've we've had a dry run of this episode where we were thoroughly schooled yeah. so now <laughs> so, now we get to do it again <laughs> so, so full disclaimer yep. if you're listening to this we why no it's secrets late from the week. npr crew and fans and such. uh yeah, we we did a we did a episode we did this last week yep. and turned out fabulous. Great, except for yeah. the most important part of the podcast: audio, the audio, <laughs> <laughs> listening. Uh, <laughs> Apparently, yeah. people want to listen to it. Weird. So, yeah. So I I tried to work some EB magic and whatever I did, it just couldn't work. So here we are to re-record again. Mm -hmm. And welcome, Mark, <laughs> to the show for the second time. How you doing, hey, man? <laughs> thanks, guys. I just want to know which one of the interns we can blame this on. Both. Both. Mm. I, I, I blame mm. both for a lot of things, some of which is not even in their purview, but um, both. They're both very good at taking blame. Okay. Yeah. Great. Well, it was 100% their fault. Like, of course. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, of course it was. <laughs> You should have this stuff all set up so we just show up. I know, and right? Talk, I right? Mean, that's all I ever yeah. want is to walk into Tinley Park and have my table completely made out before me, and I just sit in the chair and sign autographs. That's all. Is that so yeah, much you, to ask? With you Morelia, I know that's <laughs> only green M and M's. If I find one blue M and M, God help you. Yeah, dead. You're a Morelia elitist. If I've ever known one, I've never <laughs> pretended not to be. <laughs> I thought that was blatantly obvious by the fact that we have to have this episode. <laughs> like that's it's true. <laughs> so, welcome, Mark. Yeah, <laughs> please. Well, again, I I want to I I think I started uh, last week's last week's dumpster fire uh, with a huge thank you, and you know, you guys, you guys uh, are just the backbone of you know podcast in in the reptile hobby you know you've done so much good stuff you're so professional you're so you know all the things and then you pull a stunt and we like did that this. i mean yeah we had yeah. that was in hindsight that's yeah. that's not good <laughs> and so so all the thank yous and praises that that i gave last week are, are gone and void <laughs> for, for we week. started off on they, such a high last week now we don't even get revoked. we don't even get that <laughs> so now we start well the good down. thing is is that mark's original speech mm. from last week is good oh, so good. i can like just cut that in like i said last we'll put week, it in just right cut it. Just here. put it right there <laughs> <laughs> perfect perfect <laughs> The less uh, less work I have to do, the better. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. There we go. <laughs> uh, no, but you you know, as as many people have said before, you guys really uh, are are have been a huge part of my keeping. Mm -hmm. um, you know, growing growing up in the hobby and and listening to you guys and and even you know getting into uh, carpet pythons and green tree pythons through uh, the MP forums mm -hmm. back in the day and you know all all that stuff. Uh, it, it's just a uh, it it's always so fun. It's a pleasure listening to you guys talk about all the different species and um, you know all the work that you guys have put in over the years, and especially over the last you know couple of years where you've 
uh, just <laughs> vomited all over the, the podcast realm, uh, you know, with a, a smattering of every podcast everyone could ever, ever hope for or, uh, or not. It's a weird. So, it's a weird uh, three months that go by that Eric isn't like, and that's when we're starting another one. What? <laughs> like you know, that's <laughs> that's when these people are joining the crew. What the hell? All right. Like yeah. So there's yeah. We're amassing yeah. an army. Me- meetings are very yeah. odd. We're like, how many do we mm. have now? And then we both have to sit there and go. And then we both mm. miss one. Like there's always one <laughs> that we're like twenty minutes later. The monitors have one too. Damn it! So yeah, there's yeah. it's yeah. always always that one more. I don't know how you guys do it, but man, I I really am thankful for it. You guys do an incredible job. You make the hobby more fun. You bring more people together. It, it's uh, it's just kudos to you. Okay. Now. But <laughs> all that being said, you idiots. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I I have a bone to pick with both of you, nah. uh, and it is I I have listened to you guys talk down to <laughs> Green Tree Pythons and their keepers, and pretend like you don't understand what's going on. Like you act like Green Tree Pythons are this foreign language that you like have no you know basis for understanding and it is complete garbage <laughs> and so, so i am here to i my goal is not to convince you that you need green tree pythons i i am a firm believer that no one should ever have to convince anyone that they should keep an animal mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. you should keep the things that you want to keep right you know like that, sure I, if you don't want to keep green tree pythons Owen, looking at you. I do uh, do not. Yeah, <laughs> you, know, you you shouldn't have to. That's that's great. You know, maybe they are they are just too elite for the <laughs> Moralia elitist. I get it. I get it. But mm. that is not an excuse for understanding what's going on. So, right. in preparation for this episode, uh, I had gone back and listened to your interview with other buddy, aka Francis Pringle. Right. Uh, and you know I, that was I, I think it was back in 2020, and and you guys, you freaking carpet bullies, <laughs> just berated. <laughs> I mean, just stomped him into the ground. <clears throat> And then laughed at. It. And, you, know, you there was there was very little kindness and understanding. And the whole time, I'm listening to it, going, "Wait a second! No, they do understand because they, you guys then go and talk about carpet pythons that you use the same language." And so I'm here to help you bridge the gap to mm-hmm. to be the translator between. Green tree python lingo and carpet python lingo, and and show you how they actually merge together, and just give you a a just the the affirmation of you know what I do understand green tree pythons, and whether or not you keep them, that's fine. Got it. But you do understand them, and I'm here to help you with that. Okay. I will. I will have them at one point again. I will not. <laughs> I will. Um, I've just had nothing but bad luck with them. That, but yeah. So I, I, I am a bit, I guess, bitter <laughs> at myself. I'm mad at them. What? <laughs> <Those> because species? <laughs> I don't understand it. You know, and then I hear you guys say all the time, like, Oh, it's the simplest snake to keep. And I'm like, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> that, that I think happens a lot where somebody who's had success and talking with somebody who has not had success. Cause I'll, I'll put it this way. I've had, I had four green tree pythons. I have zero now did not go well. <laughs> so, um, now, now what happened with those, with those four did, did, I mean, I know that you at least gave some uh, one, one, some off, right? one went back to buddy Bishemi because that's how I got my rhino rats. Um, but then the other three were all a Ruby ox and that's where you went. I, I mean, that, that was step, step one was, I didn't, 
I didn't start on a good level, so there's that. Um, I mean, you took that evil that, exactly. That, I took, that was the one from you. That, that thing was just a monster. God, that, I probably should have kept that. Yeah, one. that thing was horrible. <laughs> it probably um, would have made. It probably would have been okay. Uh, so yeah, I got him from you, and I had two others, and then just I think one got sick and ended up just dying. I forget what exactly happened with that one. And then the other two, I want to say I sold off just because after I lost the one, I had the one, I had 2.2. So I lost the one female and I gave the other female back to Buddy. So I had two boys. I'm like, why the hell are you here? So it was one of those situations. Okay, so it wasn't necessarily that you had like bad experiences with all four of them. Yeah, one bad, was, one bad one. experience lost taste for the entire thing in my mouth. Yeah. <laughs> That's all. That's it all took? takes. Jeez. That's all it takes. Man. Yeah, he's good lord. He's weaker than I. Thought. I am. <laughs> don't don't be fooled by the strength of the beard. He is he is weak. One bad <laughs> experience with the snake and the whole species is written off for me. Gone. Gone. Yep. Take, Screw take it. My ball and I'm going. Home. I am. <laughs> That's right. That does sound like Owen. <laughs> What, what about you, Eric? Yeah, I, I know that you've had a, a number of green trees over the years. What 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 was your experience with them? So, let's see. The first couple I had seemed to be great. Um, uh, I had a, I had a, some kind of Biox Sarong cross was really the first one I got. Then I got the one from Buddy Buscemi at Carpet Fest, mm-hmm. which was a Biox, which was the all yellow Chiquita. Went to Zach, traded Molly Ringwald for it. Condro people said I was crazy. Carpet people said great I'm move. a genius. Great it's move. Just- <laughs> great move. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, that one, that one did that one was a tough trade only because that snake was just beautiful. I I when it comes to Condros, I know everybody likes the blue and the blacks and all that stuff, but I gotta tell you, man, there's something about a yellow. I mean, just the yeah. screaming bright yellow snake with uh, I, and I, I would do I a yellow, but then also I've said this numerous times. If I could find a chondro that stayed red its entire life, I'd have twelve. So yeah, That's I had uh, mm-hmm. I had an Aru. I'll, I'll tell you that I the reason I I won the the first the first time I won the uh, NPR calendar contest mm-hmm. right is be, is I literally thought to myself I know. Eric loves high yellow <laughs> because he's said- finally somebody's <laughs> finally playing to us. Like that's what you're so, supposed to do. Yeah, <laughs> and so I'm going to lean into that. Yeah, and, yeah. And I'm going to. And you won. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're the judges. There's you know what we like at this point. <laughs> like yeah. Um. <sighs> Yeah, but then uh, I got an Aru. I got a, an Aru from Bill Stiegel. So excited about this Aru, mm. right? Perfect. Captive, born and bred. Everything was great. Had it. Everything seemed to be pushing along great. Prolapse. <sighs> and I'm just like, oh, my God. I okay. Hate that. I don't know what I did wrong. I don't know. The only thing I chalked it up to, I talked to Buddy and I talked to Bill. And um, they seemed to think that maybe it was a hydration issue. Mm. Maybe, you know, I... You know, for whatever yeah, I, reason, I, I think that could be a possibility. But man, also, I, I think there's a number of reasons for prolapse, mm-hmm. and some of them I, I think come down to the nutrition of the mother beforehand. And really? so, you know, like I, I've seen, I've seen females that that were bred back to back years, mm-hmm. uh, that their first their first year's clutch was you know awesome, you know easy to establish healthy neos and then the second year a, a number of the clutch would have issues with prolapsing hmm. and wow. the, and you know the only the only thing in my mind with that is you know the the keeper is keeping the babies the same year to year mm-hmm. at least before you know to get them established and everything but maybe the female didn't have the right like the the right nutrition the right you know nutrients in, in order to pass along whatever is needed for those babies to not prolapse or at least some of them. So right. it, it, all, all that to be said is, man, it, there's, there's times when you can do everything right. And, and it, it's out of your control. And, and sometimes it's a, a genetic thing. Sometimes it's, you know, something that's just uh, passed along without nutrients. Sometimes it is a hydration thing or a food thing. Like, you know, what, who knows? 
Um, yeah. there, there is no, there is no um, direct correlation on what causes prolapse. So, yeah, I think after that one, it was sort of like, let me take a break from these for a while. Um, and then at the time I was juggling a lot of things, you know, as far as like a real big collection and, um, a lot of different types of pythons and stuff. And, um, uh, I don't know. I just felt that maybe I didn't give it the time. So I think I, I say this a lot, right. You mm -hmm. know, like I think that carpet pythons are just, and we talked about this in the uh, originally, I think carpet pythons are just tougher when it comes to, um, captivity and, you know, there's a multitude of reasons why I think maybe the biggest thing that sticks out to me is that you can find them all across Australia, basically in all different kind of environments where with the, with a green tree, they're very specific to their environments. Like you're not going to find a green tree in the Northern territory, Rocky outcrops. It's just not going to happen. Well, oh wait, well, there is, you one. are, it's called a rock. Yeah, but you are, now. but it's going to look different. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's, <clears throat> And it's that subtle change that makes it just all the, all the better. So, so I don't know. I don't know. I just don't know if it was the way I was keeping as far as like what my carpet regimen was. And it just didn't, it just didn't line up with what the chondro needed. I, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know, yeah. which is weird because I knew at the time I knew a lot of people that kept both. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so, you know, I, as, as I'm sure you've seen with carpets, you know, sometimes you, you get a, whether, whether you, you hatched a baby in your collection and you're trying to get it established and it, it, it just fails to thrive eventually yeah. or whether you sure. get one from somewhere else. Like, you know, some, some of them just have, you know, have issues, have troubles. That's, you know, the, yeah. the thing with keeping animals in general is yeah. Yeah. stuff will always go wrong. Sure. Um, and so, you know, some of it I, I would say is, is just out of our control. Uh, and I, I, I would encourage you to, to try it again and, and, you know, just, uh, well, maybe, maybe it's something that, that, uh, you know, you, you enjoy further down the road and have a great experience with, but there yeah. is, there is no argument that carpet pythons 100% are hardier, stronger, you know, more just forgiving. More, yeah. They're yeah. way yeah. more forgiving than, than yeah. a green tree python. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I, I think you bring up a great point of saying, you know, carpet pythons come from so many, just, just the carpet complex mm -hmm. comes from so many different environments and, and, you know, places where they're found, where the green trees are, they're, they're kind of on that island, man. And that island doesn't vary a ton. Mm -hmm. Even the, the islands around the island probably don't right. have a, a, a huge variance. Um, and so, yeah, they, they are much less forgiving and a much more sensitive species to uh, any any mistakes or variations to what they normally require. Um, yeah, yeah. But okay, so let's let's break it down. Okay, okay? we we've done this before. We're gonna walk through it again. All right. Probably a little a little faster, a little you know a little a little looser. <laughs> not gonna, than we did. not gonna uh, baby you guys like I did last time. <laughs> hey, here we go. <laughs> you, you better keep up. Or you're getting left behind. <laughs> this is right? this is like playing catch with a three year old. Here you go. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. <laughs> catch it. Well, that ball hit me in the face. <laughs> okay, so you guys, I. When when I listened back to the episode with other buddy, yeah. there was there was a lot of confusion with uh, with how green trees are are often labeled, and yeah. I, I think you guys have also experienced that in the carpet community as well. Uh, yeah. It's, yeah, it's just much more prevalent uh, and annoying. <laughs> I'll, I'll admit it is annoying right. in the green tree community for sure. But we're gonna break it down and and talk you guys through, you know how you you actually do understand the green tree lingo and everything by comparing so, it to carpets got it <laughs> yeah. speaking your language that's, what I'm yeah, that's yeah, okay so obviously you guys understand localities yes. right uh, locality carpets I, I, are not a are not a huge thing in in carpet pythons you know and I, really. I would say that's because you guys have very clear, uh, like dominant and recessive morphs, right? The the morph game came into carpets and 
for for the most part kind of left a lot of the localities behind mm-hmm. right but you know uh for the brisbans you know you have what port port douglas is one that's for yep. coastal you have brisbans you have port douglas um oh okay Yakapuri yeah, Depot, Rockhampton, Rockhampton, Rockhampton Coast. Yeah. right. Totally. So, yeah. so obviously, there's you guys have have the kind of the different subspecies, which now green tree pythons are, are kind of you know getting into, and, and I'm <laughs> and, I'm not here to you know, and also go we'll, into that. We'll but, also yeah, see when yeah. the new book comes out how how good we still have it. Like it, <laughs> <laughs> for all we know, yeah. this is about to be exploded. So we'll see. Yeah. Er- erase everything you yeah know. we know nothing right. anymore so <laughs> but with with green trees you guys understand localities you yeah. know obviously there is discrepancy on you know did this did this snake actually come from where it's labeled right do you trust the importer do you trust the you know the the people on the farm mm-hmm. that are you know quote unquote breeding the the snakes maybe it was wild caught maybe it was it was uh, farm bred and imported over mm-hmm. who knows but uh the reality is is that there are uh different localities of green tree pythons and of those localities there are definitely some distinguishing features that are unique to the labeled localities that we give them okay uh, and within those localities there are specific ideal looks that uh i would say in the hobby we are searching for reproducing uh the the thing that i found really interesting um when you guys talked to daniel matouche one time was he he said that throughout all of the island you can pretty much find the the green tree pythons that look all all you know, across the board, like all mm-hmm. over on Aru, you can find all green snakes on right. Biak. You can find all green snakes in, you know, the, the Highland regions, you can find all green snakes and you can also find, you know, very specific phenotypes that, you know, look like what we have in the hobby for those localities. So with, with Aru's, for example, like, like, you've had in the past eric you know no one's gr- breeding selectively breeding for an all green aru green tree python mm. no what what people are doing is they're they're breeding for high whites and high blues and you know the, like the that mixture of of white with blue blushing and and all that stuff with with bx you know no one's breeding for all green bx even though there are some like but what they're doing is they're they're breeding for more more like black wash mm-hmm. on the snake or you know a, a really high amount of yellow blotches with the green and so uh, much like the the jungle carpets that that you guys have you know it, it's like the what what was the the locality Palmerson Palmerson, Palmerson and yep. yeah, Gelatin yep. yeah those are the Tully, Tully. yeah. yeah. And so, you know, there, there were, there were certain localities of those jungles that, you know, each kind of had a distinctive look mm-hmm. to them, even though I, I assume when you went to Australia, you probably saw some variation in the carpets that you know were there. Yeah. I mean, the mm-hmm. only, out of the pictures that Eric showed and from me going to, with the only carpet that looked like it should have like looked the way it should have, where we found it was the Darwin. Like, uh, like looking at that one, I'm like, yep, that's a Darwin. Like the jungles that they yeah. found in the coastal, I'm like, that's weird. So, well, I think what you're saying is right. Like, so gelatin jungles sort of have um, <clears throat> the ones in captivity, they sort of have like these. Um, me and Rob seem to call them like railroad track lines on their mm-hmm. back in their pattern. And um, you did see that in the wild ones. So, I guess to your point, right? You're looking at you would you would sort of like try to refine that with staying within that locality, right? So if I want to right. make really really nice um, tri stripe tri stripe gelatin jungles, I could I could go down that road and refining that stripe just as you would 
We're fighting right. you're, you're going to into that stereotype right. that you okay. that you think of and say, "Man, I'm going to I'm going to refine this." With a ruse, you're going to go high white. With right. with the Jalatan jungles, you're going to go that tri stripe, you know, railroad track right. back. Right. Um, so you know the localities are you know you guys mm-hmm. get them. and I would say in in all the things with green tree pythons because we don't have super clear dominant and recessive traits everything we do whether it's with localities or or crosses or designers is going to be just polymorphism like we're we're just breeding for certain okay. looks and taking a look of a look of two adults that we hope replicates and trying to pass that on to the babies. Um, right. Everything is polymorphic to the, you know, most, mostly in green tree pythons. Obviously there, there is the albino. Um, there's just, it's just not in the hobby. You know, there, there's no, uh, that's not something that is available to everyone. Marshall has, uh, has, had a, a handful of albinos over the years that um, he's tried to establish. There's some over in Europe, but for the most part, there's less than 10 in the world. And so they, they're pretty much non-existent. Right. Um, and so everything we do is just taking two snakes mm-hmm. that, that have the look we want and then trying to replicate that look over generations. Uh, I will say that Bill and Buddy Ushimi, the, the original, right. Buddy, uh, they recently put out an episode uh, on GTP Keeper Radio, um, the first time in, in years. Praise the Lord! Thank you, Bill <laughs> and Buddy, coming out of out of brumation and <laughs> creating an episode. But they they actually had a really interesting topic on uh, on morphs in green tree pythons. Uh, Patrick Holmes was a part of that. He's another Texas guy. Um, and it, it was it was super fascinating. So if, if you haven't mm-hmm. listened to it, definitely. Check I have. It. I did. Yeah. I did my <laughs> yes. yeah. Well, I mean, it's so <laughs> rare. You'll you. I mean, when's the next time they're going to do an episode? Twenty twenty five. Twenty twenty five. Has to be. I mean, I assume now Bill goes back into his underground lair until it's time for him to emerge again. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's he's probably laying back in his pool right. Yeah, now. yeah, <laughs> most likely. <laughs> Um, okay, so we we understand localities. Right. I, I don't feel like you guys have, um, you know, it, it's not hard for you guys to grasp the locality mm-hmm. section. So then with with green trees, we also have the locality crosses. Like, mm-hmm. oh, and like you said, you had yep, the ruby yep. axe. Um, you know, with, uh, with carpets, you see it all the time. You know, someone breeds a... a a coastal to, you know, a jungle yep. and, you know, technically it's still a pure, a pure animal because those are the same genetically speaking. It is a, right? it's a Morelia. Yes. What they, the, <laughs> the offspring that coastal, it is made yeah. is a carpet it's python. A yeah. Coastals and jungles yes. are the same. Coastal yeah. and bread line. That's all I mean. No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you know, you guys, you guys understand the locality crosses, yep. and sometimes those locality crosses make phenomenal looking yeah. snakes. You know, like like there there are there are local or you know different subspecies cross uh, in carpet pythons, a diamond jungle jack or a, a diamond jungle, yeah. just period. Yeah. But I don't I don't care who you are. That is a great looking snake a lot mm-hmm. of the time. Now, agree. It what goes wrong in green tree pythons a lot of the time is that when people create a great looking snake or they have this locality cross that you know just looks awesome, they go off on their own and call it a designer mm-hmm. and and label it. They they just say, oh, this designer, this you know high yellow arubiac or you know what it's from it's from you know, high yellow lineage and it's, it's an Aru and a Biak. And you're like, well, no, it, if it's not one of the like specific designer lines that traces its, you know, its pedigree all the way back, then it's not right. What you have is a locality cross and that 
doesn't take away from the beauty of the snake. It, you know, it, it's still a phenomenal looking snake, but don't, don't mix the word designer with locality cross. Okay. And, and I, I would assume you guys have, have experienced <laughs> so much, you know, <laughs> what it maybe, maybe it's like inflating of the carpet pythons that people have yeah. uh, when, when you're actually like, mm, that's not as special as you think. My, it is. my favorite you know? is that. So, <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> something's wrong with that statement. Um, I think like, okay, so let, let I, now that you're saying this, right, I, I thought pops into my head, right? Okay, so I'm with you as far as like if you're crossing an Aru and a Biak, you're making a, a, a locality cross, right? Sometimes from these, I chalk it up to hybridization, right? That would be my thought. Um, and possibly the lineage that comes along with those animals may come into play. If you have a really nice Biak, really nice lines, and then you have a really nice Aru, you know, with high whites and blues and, and you know, all this kind of stuff, you're probably going to make at least a couple really, really nice animals. So at what point does that animal become something that would fall under lemon tree or Mr. Blue, or like, why, why is it those animals that get highlighted when re in, in my thinking would be, is that's kind of what was done earlier, right? You kind of just cross different localities to see what you would get. So why is it, is it just like, there's a certain amount of time that has to pass until it becomes a, uh, you know, a designer? Does it have to routinely throw specific things, uh, specific looks? Like I think of mosaic we talked about last time where, you know, at this point, it pretty consistently throws this same type of look. To me, that would fall into a morph category. So like where, where, where when does it, when does that become, is it like a, is it like a, uh, this, a, a special animal like the sickness or the remedy or something like that? These animals that just, they stand out of the crowd are, are, is that what would designate a designer down the line? Yeah. So that's, that's the, that's the great, like maybe not the great debate, but there is, there is some like different interpretation of when a designer line begins and, you know, the, the locality crosses the mutts end, you know? And right. so for me personally, uh, mm -hmm. my stance, it might vary from other people's, but what I would say is, there are there are only you know a, a handful of designer lines out there. Some of them, much to your point, uh, have early on been crossed. You know, different localities were crossed, and mm -hmm. you know it, it was just a, a smorgasbord of you know take all the best looking chondros. Doesn't matter which locality they're from. Let's let's breed them together. Make some crazy colors. And and you know see how wild we can get this. Some of some of the designer lines, like the Calico line, uh -huh. uh, is is absolutely uh, you know like that. There there's not pure animals uh, that you know were bred together to make the Calico line what it is. It you know right. looking back in the pedigree, it it's all across the board, and mm -hmm. it was just let's take the most radical animals and and breed them together, and then breed siblings, and then outcross it back and. And so because of that, the, the Calico line has wild looking animals. Now the Calico line is a line because it continues to produce a similar look over multiple generations okay. that is recognizable. And so for me, that that is one of the key ingredients to a designer line is one that its pedigree can be traced back to it, its founding animals mm -hmm. and two that it has a look that will be passed on and is recognizable through multiple generations and so you know with with the lemon tree line with the calico line with the the high blue lines uh the trooper walsh blue line the andrew amon blue line like 
those those are all lineages of animals that you can trace back their their pedigree all the way back mm-hmm. to their founding animals and they consistently put out a similar look to the offspring down the line now that doesn't mean that a hundred percent of their offspring end up looking uh phenomenal they absolutely right. produce green animals out of out of those lines um but there there are certain uh, characteristics and, and factors that can be seen in uh, the the you know subsequent generations. And so o- over in Portugal with Pedro, uh, his his mosaic line. It, I I'm hesitant to call it a line yet because it he I I don't think he has bred mosaics children. Okay. Yet to make the the F twos, uh, okay. he is. But he has bred mosaic to radical looking animals, and he has bred mosaic to drab, you know, locality animals. And there is a consistent look across the board of the offspring of mosaic that you can tell they they look wild. And if if those children when they reproduce once again create these wild looks i i would say hands down that that is kind of solidifying mosaic as a line uh in whatever official sense that green tree keepers want to say is that as far as you would go say with like with that as far as you would go is that if the offspring of the original can produce offspring of them of their own that resemble their sire or damn like the, the the back like the original founder is that where you'd start saying now you kind of have a line going and now you are potentially building that yeah again okay. I, it's open for interpretation mm-hmm. you know i i think i think if you ask you know five different people you'd probably get eight different answers eight different answers yep <laughs> for me i i would say yes to your to your question that if if the children, if the mm-hmm. children's children continue to, to have this this same look, whether that's high blue, high black, high yellow, then for for me that says, look, there's something going on here that is being passed down. Mm-hmm. You know, call it a morph, call it call it whatever you want. It, it's it's polygenics at play. You know, you're, right. you're taking animals with a look that are passing on genetic information that are giving their offspring a similar look. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and that is to me a, a a line, you know, three, three points really start putting a line into that direction. Um, And so that's, for me, that's what I would say is a real like official distinguishing factor of a designer line. For you guys, I, I would say, uh, Madam Blueberry would fall into that, you know. Right. I, I would say, um, uh, Eric, what what was the melanistic carpet that you had? Poison, poison ivy. Poison <clears throat> ivy. I, yep. I would. Poison ivy wasn't uh, wasn't a locality cross. Wasn't you know anything? No. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it, she was wild she was IJ. A, yeah, mm-hmm. she was such a, a yeah. freak that that came out with a a very unique look and you leaned into that to see if that look was going to, you know, prevail genetically through generations. And my, I don't know the outcomes of that. Um, but you know, I would say so that far it's looking good. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and I would say that in, in green tree lingo, that, that poison Ivy would be, the start of a designer line, the founder of that line. Um, okay. if, if it's continued to, to prevail into those dark, uh, dark carpet pythons. Um, so, so as long as okay. you can kind of identify offspring in the line, like th- that, that's kind of what you're trying to, to go at is that you can continually see, by looking at this animal that this is clearly a calico line or a lemon tree line or some of that by the distinct parts of it. That's what makes it part of the line. 
Yes, I, yeah. I would say that's that's one of one of the boxes that needs to be ticked in order to call it a like a designer. Uh, okay, and designer line. So this is where I think this is good that we're having this second conversation. But um, this is where I think the carpet python and you the lose us. green yeah. tree <laughs> python world where we split, right? Yeah. Because if you're talking about Madame Blueberry or you're talking about Poison Ivy or you could be talking about Gamma, mm -hmm. we look at that as just selective breeding of a morph, right? right. So like... I guess well, in a way not, it's sort not of blueberry. This... Well, because she was a wild kind of type. Is. Well, yeah, she is. The problem is that she is now. They produce she... red babies, right? So generation after generation, they produce red babies, right? But and you can you can also have red babies from from other, other stuff. stuff. Yeah, that is not as potent as Madame Blueberry Benjamin, right? If, and if then you're you also at have. It. If you also have the, let me. I'll finish this thought. Go, go, you, go. Can, you can uh, correct. You're talking me. coastal to get us excited. Yeah. <laughs> right, <I know. laughs> Same thing with gamma, right? You have this 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 diamond jungle jag, right? I would argue that part of the reason that that snake is the way it looks is because it's a cross, right? So yeah. you're taking a jungle jag. You've already crossed that. You've taken a jag, which is a coastal carpet. Which they look nice, but let's face it, they're khaki looking. You put the jungle in there. Now all of a sudden you've amped up that khaki to, oh a, my God, it's to, yellow. A, to a bright yellow. <laughs> and now you come along and now you put the diamond in there and it just seems to intensify not only the, the black and the uh, it intensifies the yellow. If you look at guys like Martin Rosemond, right? Mm -hmm. He's breeding. He's he's really taking the gamma line to the next level, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and he consistently breeds jungles back to that to just keep making them as bright yellow and as as much as the clutches that he can get. You know, and and slowly but true. I don't think we look at that though as the same way as like the green. Like at that point. You're talking about so, like, if I'm going to buy a diamond jungle jag, you would go and look for a diamond jungle jags, and they're all gonna they're gonna be a variety of people that produce them, but you want it from this lineage, right? Mm -hmm. So, I guess if I was looking for a blue chondro, I would want a Mister Blue. Like, oh, it's got Mister Blue in the lineage. It's it's carrying those genetics, right? Exactly. So, in in the green tree world, we we kind of look at these designer lines very much like uh kind of uh championship bloodlines in dog breeding okay and so you know if, if once once a line has been recognized by the the chondro community you know whether it's the the trooper walsh blue line or the calico line man once once that's there any any animal that has that in its lineage, it is technically in the designer lineage. You know, you, you can't, mm -hmm. it, no matter how much you outcross it, you can't take away that pedigree that traces back to the, the craziness of the animals. And mm -hmm. the unfortunate thing with green trees, uh, and I, I would say you guys see it in carpets as well, is that within a clutch, you, you really have a ton of variants Right, yeah, much much more so in green trees, or at least where it's more noticeable. Where you know some some turn out completely green, and then others you know are black and blue, and you know just look yeah phenomenal. Uh, but even even in uh, in carpets, you know I, I'm sure that there were Madame Blueberry offspring, uh, or you know even just down the line that snakes that had MBB and Benjamin in their lineage that probably didn't turn out to be like the most jaw dropping, uh, you know, eye sure. popping. Right. Right. Topic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but they would still have that bloodline in their lineage to, to even hint at the possibility that they have the keys to create that desired look that started in the lineage at some point. Uh, okay. So this is where the break kind of happens for me. So if I took, Say like I had a green tree from a really good look looking pairing of something, but it just happened to be one of those babies that turned green. 
taking that baby and breeding it to another, we'll say, green snake, do I have the potential of making something crazy? Or is it because I've stepped out away from the crazy guys in the line? <laughs> is that like, the, like how far is the drop off? Because even like you said, if I have an ugly Madam Blueberry Benjamin and I breed it to the right carpet, I can still get some phenomenal animals. They'll be less in the group, but sure. Sure. there you, might you still be a one lower possibility right. or maybe less yeah. likely of creating right. the that you want, but the potential is still there, right? So the potential is still there with a green tree python or is that gone? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And we've, we've seen it time and time again, you know, looking at Bill Stiegel. So mm -hmm. Bill produced jaeger or sorry bill produced the sickness out of jaeger which had some melanism in his pedigree okay uh bred to a all green nothing special female okay and and the sickness popped out right, right? uh bill uh, another pairing that bill did he there's a, a famous blue chondro called blue deuce well mm -hmm. Bill has an offspring from Blue Deuce that is completely green. It is, okay. and he calls it Green Deuce, just <laughs> as you know, you know, just as, Bill and Bill, 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 Bill Stiegel Bill. Yeah. fashion. Yeah, because it's Bill. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> Bill bred the Green Deuce animal to a blue animal and mm -hmm. produced phenomenal blue animals, and so. Yes, the the same thing applies. Exactly what okay. you said with carpets. If you if you take two phenomenal animals and you put them together, you're going to have a higher likelihood of producing phenomenal animals. Okay. If you take two drab animals from phenomenal lineage and you put them together, you still have the potential, although it is likely a lower potential to create that desired look because you're not, you're not passing on the best of the, the genetics for mm -hmm. whatever that look is, but there's a chance that there's still something locked in there that you can, you know, watch play out if it's with the right pairing. I love how so, like this is a step up from the people buying normal ball pythons at the reptile show going like they could be head for something. <laughs> like I love how that's it's one step above and that's where we all are. And we're like totally different. It's completely you're, different. You're saying, you're <laughs> like, saying yeah, the green tree python <laughs> breeding is just one big dinker project. It, I mean, <laughs> yes. Well, so, okay. I hope, I hope I'm remembering this right. Right. So I remember mm. Rob, when he got back into green trees years ago, right? His idea along with my idea was, okay, so why don't we just try to recreate some of the uh, pairings that were done in the early days um, and try to make another line or at least something that you could see what happens as far as, you know, what other crazy color or pattern or whatever is going to mm -hmm. pop out um, by crossing localities. Um, but I think, I, I, I think where, I think where a lot of the disconnect, I, I'm understanding it a little bit better now, mm -hmm. but I think the way I heard it back then was, is like, well, even if you did, let's just say that I bought a whole group of Aru's and I brought a whole group of Manaquaris, right? And I, I, I have these animals and I breed them together and I produce amazing things that look like the sickness or mosaic or lemon tree, what, whatever it would be. Just crazy looking animals. At the end of the day, does it matter that I call it this name or that name? Like at some point, aren't isn't the, isn't the chondro world going to have to sort of like sort of tried to establish other lines so that, you know, you don't have bottleneck or you don't have inbreeding depression or things like that. Not that probably you guys would because, huh. uh, you know, and then the other thing I just want your thoughts on is like, is there a problem with the perspective of green trees when it comes to the community? Right. It's because when you're looking at carpets, right. Carpets have always been split up, mm -hmm. right. So you've either been a, a purist or you just mix and match whatever you want to mix and match, right? Um, yeah. Whereas chondros in the early days, 
We're just one thing. Right? Now they're split. And possibly two. Like, clearly, you can see a difference between a Bioc and an Aru. And if you can't see that, then you probably shouldn't be working with snakes. But if you're looking at an Aru and you're looking at a Bioc, you're saying, oh, wow, these are different things, mm -hmm. right? There's something different about these two. The head is different. The tail is different. The, the body structure, they're just different snakes. Yeah. Um, so do the old, like, old school green tree keepers look at it as, like, they still have a hard time accepting that like, because I used to get a lot of pushback from, from, from older school green tree people when I would say, well, that's just because it's a hybrid. <laughs> oh, you're crazy, man. We've been breeding these for years since it's the amazing 70s. like that because You've it's lost a hybrid. Your mind. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, but if I took a brettles and a diamond jungle Jag and I bred it together, I'm going to get scream and it's going to be amazing, but I'm right. not sitting there pretending like it's something that it's not. So I don't know. There's a lot to unpack there, but yeah, I, don't I mean, know. What's you your know, thoughts? The, the the crazy thing for for the green tree community is a lot of us a lot of us knew that yeah, these were at least different subspecies, if not full species. But right. because they're all lumped in together, you know the the conscience was clean. Uh, to yeah, some, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and so I'm doing like, no wrong. Okay, <laughs> right, right. and understandably, and, right? Yeah, it, I get you know, it. You can you can go as fast as you want on a street that doesn't have a speed limit sign. Of course, that's the right. rule, right? <laughs> so, so once once Dana and Tush came out with the paper, I I definitely feel like uh, a lot of us, especially people that had been in the hobby for a while, mm -hmm. we we read it nodded our head yes and said yeah of course like this you know it it doesn't it it didn't change a whole lot i don't think mm -hmm. for the, the people that had been in the hobby and, and you know had already looked at these different localities and said obviously they're different mm -hmm. um, and with green trees because we're breeding so much for looks um and and specific you know just polygenetic traits uh we're, we're looking at so much at phenotypes i i feel like the the allure toward specific pure locality breeding often got put on the back burner yeah um, mm -hmm. now i i will say there are people that uh that are focusing on localities and in in the world of carpets you guys have i i would say you have designer lines within those specific species so like in pen yeah. coastals yeah uh, are a those are a designer line of coastal carpets yeah with with green trees we have uh prada manaquaries dave prada created these you know fantastic manaquaries that you know they they time and time again had so much blue had so much pattern like they were they were gorgeous um they're and they're there's other one there's uh jovinsky he had um manaquaries and sarongs uh ron smurs he had sarongs that were um just a, a line of those um and, doesn't and gary like, Sharvino make really good manaquaries too gary Sharvino, gary Sharvino, he is really really just all in on the manaquaries and he very very soon i i would say you're gonna hear about Gary's line of manaquaries. And he, and he uses some of the, the Prada manaquaries, some of the Vinsky stuff. Like Gary has that blood in his mm -hmm. collection and he's also importing uh, other manaquari, just wild types and, and everything in order to focus on that species. Sure. Um, and so cool. there, there are people that are being, uh, more inspired and, and just drawn into the pure locality aspect of keeping chondros. Um, but I, I feel like because just for so long, we've, we've been one, you know, focused on just the phenotypes and man, mm -hmm. if it looks pretty. Let's, let's put it together. And two, they're, for so long, we've been under the, you know, just the, the false umbrella of, oh, well, it's all one species, just throw it together anyway. Right. Right. And, you know, we, we haven't 
we haven't seen much, um, you know, like many consequences from that. Like their fertility still seems okay. You know, there, yeah. I guess at least no one has done a study on, you know, declining fertility in crosses of animals. Uh, that, that might be a thing. I, I just haven't seen the paper on it. Mm. Yeah. I would argue maybe it would be better, right? Long-term because you would be, I mean, I know. So part of that, well, that, that's another was one other one of my rubs when it came to green trees. Right. And, and, and probably from a, from a selfish standpoint, right. I wanted just a green snake with a white stripe. Some and, white I that, <laughs> and I know that's a big ask, right. I know that that's what everybody's looking for or whatever, but I would be happy with just the locality of Meraki's. Right. I'm like, Absolutely. okay, one well, of my this is favorite localities I love of all time. Yes. They're great. 100%. Um, I can't find, well, I haven't looked I mean, in a long time, but I haven't, been, I wasn't able to find them. I kept talking to, you know, Condra people like what, you know, what's going on? Why, why is nobody capitalizing on, on localities? Why is everybody chasing this blue or yellow or something yeah. different than what nature is? And I think where my rub always came is because talking to people over and over again with this elitist type of attitude. And I'm not saying that the carpet people aren't guilty of this. No, no well. we suck too. So but mm. with this elitist attitude where, where they poo poo ball pythons for chasing a morph and chasing a dollar sign. And my argument would be, but aren't you doing the same thing? Like yeah. meaning that you're doing the same thing and you're enjoying it. Well, maybe the person that's doing ball pythons and making a super spider lemon blast blah 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 chocolate. i only understood half really? of what you said <laughs> right yeah maybe they're enjoying it too right mm -hmm. like i mean Absolutely. maybe they, they, they that's their thing like why why are we knocking down that to make this somewhat better like i don't yeah. understand that mentality that mind th that that mindset like i i don't get that like just own what you're doing right if you're mm -hmm. like after making the bluest prettiest conjure that you can well own it own it right and part yeah. of owning that is is that yeah i'm doing this because i want to make really pretty snakes and they're going to fetch a high price tag now maybe your main goal is not to make money off of it right i i understand that we we all kind of like have our little things and whatever and maybe you're just going to make a million dollars off of it but probably not right like mm -hmm. i mean with a melanistic ij there isn't really a melanistic gene per se in carpets so if all of a sudden I'm producing melanistic IJs, to me, I would be a bit hypocritical if I turn around and sell this for a high price tag saying like, you know, these are what these are worth. And then saying like, oh, these ball python people are just after money. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean that I'm just after money and it doesn't mean that they're just after. But maybe their their perspective is the same as what I'm doing. And I'm just doing it because I want to make cool looking snakes. And it just so happens that I got lucky. And I pulled this lotto uh, ticket and I got this cool snake. You know what I mean? Like when Bill hatched out the sickness, he's like, oh, shit, I freaking won the lottery. You mm -hmm. know? Absolutely. Like, <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah. So, and yeah, I think I think you bring up a great point. And, and in many ways, it it is very similar. You know, like we uh, across so many snake species like, man, we're trying if you are breeding snakes you are trying to make the best looking snakes. That doesn't, mm. that doesn't matter if you're crossing, you know, yeah. if you're, you know, doing you're staring pure, like you have, you have an image in your head that you are trying to produce the best looking replica of that image or right. the most exaggerated, you know, mm -hmm. way that that image could look. Right. Now I, I would say that I, I love, ball pythons right you know why because they're snakes mm -hmm. right <laughs> i i love snakes yeah, man yeah. like like i i don't keep any i i don't have any i right they don't uh you know they don't do it for me but right. i i don't have anything against ball pythons i think ball pythons are awesome right now the rub that i see with the ball python mentality is because you can just get the morphs that yep. there really isn't a, a attitude of refinement 
and mm-hmm. oh, let's make it better. Where you can just say, okay, great, I want a you know, I, I want a lightning pied. So I will take Exantic, I will take Pied, I will put them together, and I made my thing great. Now I'll sell it, and you know, and I'm I'm gone. Where there's just not many people that are saying, "Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna make the best." What, who's who's the guy that had the crazy pastels? That was Al B. Too Cool. Al B. Yeah, Too Cool. Al, Al B. Too Cool pastels. Man, <laughs> yeah. there, there was a refinement factor. Mm-hmm. Yes. That he said, I, "I'm not just gonna make pastels. I'm gonna hold back the best pastels, and I'm gonna I'm gonna like really go in on this." There there is a another guy that's doing it with um with exantics and, and there are a couple people that like they found yeah. their thing and yeah. that like the, there's one yeah, person that's like in yeah the whole, it's I like oh i'm doing monarchs and all my shit is going to be monarch Whoa. stuff Owen. and yes, buddy. Listen, Woo. hey 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 this is <laughs> your one hey. time monarch. per year Whoa. that, that i'll admit that i deep blue. dive into wow. some things okay <laughs> wow everyone enjoy everybody good Okay. Oh, you, wow. that, you, better, you better hope that this audio doesn't get lost. I hope oh. it dies. Then now we have to wreck this episode. Um, but but there's some people that do well, that where they decide that yeah. they're gonna do that thing and then that's their thing. And I would say that it's easier in some species than it is with others. And we I mean well, it happens in, with in quite things. Ones, there is the allure of right. creating the next like adding right one that is a big drive that so, is a huge drive i don't think so anymore finding what you have where i think that's I think, still there no well i think to a certain extent but i think it's changed right so mm-hmm. here l- listen to hear me out for a second i think that the ball python had to go through m- a maturity that the whole market the whole way that they do things right and i i think with part of that is is that we we saw ball pythons at a time where the morphs were just coming out. I think that a lot of people thought that they could get rich off of, you know, getting these morphs. And to your point, Mark, just putting them together and, and making more of whatever it would be, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, maybe you took what you could get. Um, you know, you just sort of were like, okay, I'm going to try, I'm going to try this and I'm just going to yeah. see what it comes. I get well, this Andy, wild so call. Appreciation happened so fast that you, sure. it, it really was a, a like snatch and grab job with a lot of those morphs. Right. Show all you can and then dump it. And then I think right. like, I think what happened is, is that, and it happened in the carpet Python world too. And then all of a sudden it went away. Right. It's mm. like, I'm going to, I even did it. It's like, I wonder what a, X, 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 X would look like. Right. I wonder what combining these four genes is going to look like, right? And you just do it to see what happens. And then you're like, okay, well, that looked cool. I wonder what happens if we add five genes. And now, now you're like, okay, mm-hmm. that's cool. Let's see what happens when we add six. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, I think what happened is they sort of bottlenecked into turning into like this white, not white, cream colored, no pattern, the complete opposite look of what a ball python in the wild looked like. It wasn't attractive at all. It didn't grow into an attractive adult. If anything, it got worse as it aged. And mm-hmm. I think people put on the brakes and said, whoa, wait, hold on. What, what's going on here? Clearly, we're putting too many genes into this. Let's back up and let's say, like, I think of, of Bill is a perfect example of this, right? He has Candino's. And he has, you know, he, he works with a lot of ball pythons. I know that, but like, he's like a, he's like a, a three gene type of guy, right? Like I'm making a pinstripe Candino. I'm making a, Mm -hmm. you know, um, I don't even know, but you know what I'm saying to where it's like, okay. And I'm going to, I'm going to keep the ones that look really good and I'm going to hold it back. Kabilka does this as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is sort of the new norm in the ball Python world where it's like, okay, pick a gene, work with it, refine it, you know, make it the best you can see what genes work with it, the best that it can and just go with that. But I think that, 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 that a certain maturity has to happen for that to happen. Yeah. And, and I, I, I wouldn't say that that is the new norm of the ball Python industry, but I, I have seen more people leaning into that. 
Right. And so I, I hope I hope that that becomes, you know, the, the new norm right. for at least some of the industry. I think sure. there is a yeah. great part of the industry that stacks, stacks the morphs and creates the creates the yeah. next thing. Like, man, sure. the the fact that that you can never run out of the the combination of morphs that you can put together with ball pythons that's freaking cool mm-hmm. ball pythons I, I heard one time that ball pythons are the most genetically diverse animals on the planet <laughs> like what <Wow>. that's insane <laughs> wow. yeah. like that, that makes them so cool that they can they can be all one species but have this like crazy genetic diversity uh, that that's amazing right um and i i i think it that stacking the the morphs and the genes is a great thing, but it's also needed to have that refinement factor. And so, yeah. with, you know, you guys saw it with carpets too. You know, you, you stack on, you know, you have a, a super zebra caramel jag. Well, you're, you're just getting towards kind of a, a muddy, a muddy looking snake, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, with with green trees because we don't have those like specific dominant recessive trait or or, uh morphs right we just as as keepers haven't been able to lean into those you know that morph stacking that a lot of the other species have and Mm -hmm. so you know because of that, we, you know, we create this elitist mentality and, you know, consider ourselves better than everyone because, because we, we want to refine the animals that we have. We want right. to create the bluest animals or the blackest animals or the most high yellow animals and, you know, poo poo on anyone that just does gene stacking. Um, and, and so it, I do think that there is a huge similarity with it. Um, while there's also the differences in, you know, how you're going about the projects that you have. Are you, mm-hmm. are you oh, just yeah. chasing, sure. chasing the, the stacking yeah. of morphs or are you wanting to take, you know, a handful of things and really refine it and run, run with it? No way is, is right or wrong. Uh, in the green tree world, we just don't have that capability to the stack option. morphs yeah. on top of each other. I think, I think for myself, I can only speak from my own experience. Right. But I think that like, I had this mentality that I have to complete the set, right. Somehow Mm -hmm. if I want to be somebody in this carpet Python world, I'm sure it's the same, whether it's carpets, chondros or ball pythons, whatever it would be, is that you sort of have to have the best animals. You sort of have to produce the best animals and, you know, you, you get into this, I, 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 see, I see it with myself and just how my breeding progressions have come along, right? I see where people sort of step back and said, okay, well, me and Owen, right? Just mm. look at caramels, right? Owen has spent the last, what, since 2010? God only knows. Yeah, well, yeah. My first clutch of caramels so, was 2010. So, so 12 years, he's been working on refining the caramels. And I would argue that he has some of the best caramels in the U S right. Thank because you. he's put that 12 years of work into it. Like, yeah. And I don't first, let, I keep all the good ones for myself. And if I'm being <laughs> honest, like he would show me them and I, you know, and I would look at mine and I would look at his and I'm like, okay, yeah, they look the same to me, you know, but like slowly over time, he's holding back the better ones and holding back the better ones and holding back the better ones and breeding yeah. them and raising them and now producing even better than that generation and better and better yeah. and better and making them, brighter or redder or, you know they they bronze up when they age at yeah. a certain point or whatever my girls um, from last year are going to be killer <laughs> when, they're, when they're right when they're old enough yeah but where he <laughs> said okay eric's going hog wild and he's buying every morph that there is right i'm just going to stay here with my caramels i was also go- horribly broke and couldn't but, afford to go toe-to-toe with you with like would, the yeah but i would argue <laughs> that you're so much farther ahead than me uh, yeah yeah in you know some, what I'm saying? in some things yes i would yeah in some things yes which, but like which, i, I know, can see that and yeah, i'm starting to slowly get that mindset to where it's like okay pick a lane mm. and, stay, and work with that it. lane <laughs> right. yeah so, you know right, right now i feel like there's a there's a, a big a big push toward uh 
diversifying our collections. You know? Yeah. And, and, we, and we, you know, say how important it is to keep such a, a diverse collection and, you know, all, all that stuff. And I, I don't deny that. I think keeping mm-hmm. a diverse collection is, is a good thing, but I, I would argue that, that keeping a specific direction, like a, Mm-hmm. having an anchor in your collection is more important than yeah. having a diverse collection right and, and you know, having like like owen with with the the caramels and the coastals like man have having that as your specialty helps you to lean in and and really refine what that's going to look like and mm-hmm. eventually create the best looking you know, coastals that are out there. Um, and, and, you know, you still have, you know, th- your, your odds and ends and your, you know, diversity that you can be distracted with and all the stuff. Yeah. I have and 35 I, different I species. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I went on a little bit of a kick recently. It's and almost I gotta, like we went like this. I got to cool it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with the amount of shit I got going on over here. Um, yeah. I, I, I agree that diversity is good, but I also agree that you need to have the core species that will never, ever leave your collections. Like no matter what happens, there will be carpet pythons and rough scale pythons in my collection. Other ones, ebb and flow. I might have, I might walk downstairs and realize that I have 12 team more pythons at one point, but you know, and then cut that down, but that's purely purely theoretical, right? Yeah, exactly. The hypothetical thing. thing. Never, never. Yeah. So, but that's well, okay, but like so let's, you, you're never going to get rid of your chondros, and Eric's never going to get rid of his IJs, right? But other Absolutely. things will come and go, yeah, totally. Well, I, I do want to go back because yeah. one of the things we just touched on, specifically with uh, with Owen and and the the caramels, you know, especially, uh, you know, one of the things that I know you guys have issues with in the green tree world is how do you pick holdbacks <laughs> and you know with with chondros it it is very different than it is with the the carpets but i would argue that it is also very similar where okay. owen you have seen so many young carpets over over you know the years that you've done it yeah where Baby carpets don't look great. You know? <laughs> no, they look no. horrible. <laughs> but you have you have identified key factors, key you know things, whether it's uh, you know a, a sharpness of the pattern or you know a, a different color that you're looking for, mm-hmm. it, and that probably changes with mm-hmm. with different projects. You know, uh, you're gonna you're gonna look at a, a red baby much different than you're going to look at a, a caramel baby or, you know, a yeah. whatever. Yeah. And so there's going to be different characteristics that you identify as the highest potential for the look that you're eventually wanting in the adults uh, to be your holdbacks, right? Mm-hmm. Now, I would also venture to say that you probably don't have a 100% success rate in always picking the, you know, <laughs> top three Uh, I I will say out of, okay. So two years ago, I, I somehow the stars aligned and I got two really good looking females as my holdbacks first go kick ass. Then I got cocky this past year and I'm like, this one, this one looks awesome. This one's my holdback. And she turned out. Okay. I'm like, ah, (laughs) crap. (laughs) So even then so you are you are speaking chondro language right there. You are humming our same tune, man. Because in in the chondro world, especially after you've done it for X amount of time, mm-hmm. there absolutely one hundred percent are those defining characteristics that we are looking for in the babies that are often unique to the project that we're on where we can identify with relative certainty which ones are going to be the the best looking of the clutch. And that that only comes with the experience, much like you guys with the carpets. Right? Even but, though they go through that much of an extreme of a color change. 
Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Because the carpets are still going through an extreme color change. Yeah, but it's not as obvious. <laughs> yeah, they're not, they're not going, you know, they're not going from solid yellow to something else. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but there, there is in, in a, a chondro breeder that is locked in on a project and has produced babies year after year would, would absolutely have a, a very strong handle on, I know which, hold back which babies are going to be my holdbacks and are likely to be the best looking adults now do some of the best ones still escape out the door absolutely 100%. Gotcha. but within the certain projects there are indicators for the babies to say i know that this is going to be something special uh, when when bill hatched the sickness i i saw the sickness as a fresh neonate and there was no denying looking at that at that baby where you said like it's you'd be an idiot to not keep that baby fresh out of the egg you knew it was special mm. I, I have i have uh chondros here that were yellow babies and red babies where i knew the project that i was i was leaning into and when they hatched i said absolutely not even a question those are my holdbacks and they turned out to be the best of the clutch and so it it just comes down to that that keen eye that experience that you know knowing knowing your species and your snake so well and how they're going to develop like even having that that like all seeing eye that future future mindset of okay i can look at this carpet baby and see that like that's going to be bright yellow or, you know, just beautifully caramelized all over, even though it's drab and ugly. Now the Condro guys can do that just as well. It, mm. it's just a more radical color change that we have to wait for in order to see if we're right. Is it typical for the Condro? Well, I should say, is this more typical for most Condro people to, um, hold back most of the clutch, at or least, especially in the beginning. Like, you know, my thought, I guess I got this from Luke Snell, right? It's like, you would look at things develop to your point, right? You would see these, you know, little markers and I wonder how that's going to turn out. So like my thought, and I got made fun of early on in the early days of NPR is that how are you going to hold them all back? Right. But my idea was like, how do you learn that? if you don't produce them and look at it and see yeah. what it turns into. Right. And then, and then to your point, I guess you're going to start to see little traits, right? It's hard to put into words. It's hard to say on a podcast. It's hard to sort of say like, Oh, I look for X, you know, yeah. like yeah. I think well, I said, it's differ with, with each project too. Right. Sure. I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, not yeah. going to look for the same traits in a high yellow project as I am in a high blue project. Right. Um, but you know, it, the, I, I think the, the problem that Conjure guys run into it is less less of an issue with the carpet guys. I, I think for you know when at what age does a carpet like come into its adult colors? Would you say two years? Two years? I, they they go through they go through a small color change about at a year old when they really kind of settle into their adolescent colors, and then they'll sh they'll brighten up again and they'll kind of give you a whole different level when they get about to two, two to yeah, three. There's like a, there's an ugly phase. Yeah. yeah. So they look so hideous so for a while. You, when They're are you born certain, ugly? When are you certain of like, Oh yeah, this is the screamer of the clutch. When they get close to a year old for me. Okay. Cause okay. now I'm so like, all right, I've seen this thing develop thought. and it will, it'll plateau off. Now I know that we talked last time and you actually said that there's, the problem I have is that when we talk with Condro guys way back when, they were like, all the good shit comes out of red babies. If there are yellow babies, fuck them. Ah, like, you know, throw yeah. it out. Not worth it. And then it's like apparently there are other projects where yellow babies are important. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I. Yes, there are some people that hold back all their all their babies from their clutches until right. a certain point. And okay. oftentimes the problem is space mm -hmm. and money. When right. there's people offering you 
crazy, crazy money. Chondros right now are crazy money. Yeah. And and mm-hmm. people are in line to pay it. It's it's easy to say, yeah, I can let go of some of these. Yeah. And and if if some of them are gonna turn out to be green snakes, when yeah. you're going for high blue snakes, well, to you don't s- have to hold them all. Sell, <laughs> to sell the dream of a red <laughs> neo that could be blue, that that's probably a better a better sell, a higher dollar than oh well, this is a green snake, but let but, me tell you, yeah. it's <laughs> it's got blue on the inside, and that's right. you know. And, and so, not that it's all about money by any means, but there there is like Chondro people are we are twisted, demented people that w- we want to play the lottery. We okay. want to we want to take a chance. Psychopaths, all of you. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. We want to take a chance that we could strike gold. Uh, and so, yes. Uh, all all that being said is. Oh, and you mentioned that the the red babies are often the most sought after. It, it is it is no secret that red babies, for the most part, are also priced higher. They're mm-hmm. more desirable, uh, you know. And much of that is because back in the day, guys like Trooper Walsh, Rico Walder, uh, Greg Maxwell, they were they enjoyed the red babies more. And so back in the those 70s, were their holdbacks. Yeah, and so they, they were they were wanting the darkest red babies and the brightest blue adults, and so that's that's where a lot of it came from. Now mm-hmm. there's there's no argument that if you want a blue a like blue snake, the way to do it is to get a dark red neonate from blue lineage. Gotcha. And, and you have a you have a a great potential to, to you know come out with a blue snake. Uh, black is is very closely tied to blue, and so if you want a if you want a dark black chondro, man, probably go in with some of that blue line lineage, some melanistic lineage, and get the darkest, most patternless neonate that you can. But a lot of that is because selective breeding has happened to make that trait true. Okay. I would I would argue that you could achieve the same thing with yellow neonates or at least a similar version of the same thing if you gave it you know 15 okay. years that that these other guys have been you know the, the Trooper Walsh blue line with red neos has been has been established for I mean, decades and decades. It, it's so you could do it with yellows, but you'd be starting from scratch as opposed to doing it with red neos. You're already 50 years down the line. So, exactly. okay, exactly. Now, one of one of the projects that I am really passionate about is creating colorful adults from yellow neonates. Okay. That's, one of, that's one of my projects that I have. And the the really cool thing that I've I've found from it is that I took two yellow neonate parents mm-hmm. that both had relatively high amounts of melanism on them. I bred them together and they created yellow all yellow neonates, right? If you mm-hmm. if you breed two yellow parents, yellow neonate parents together, you get all yellow clutch. And Many of those offspring ended up being high melanistic, super colorful, like, and that's just one generation. And so okay. the the potential for someone to run with yellow neo projects, I think, is really high. But you gotta you gotta be willing to play the long game and just say, mm-hmm. you know what, if you wanna if you want a high blue snake, you can absolutely get it from you know a ruse and sarongs and yellow neo manaquaries and mm-hmm. it, those those yellow neo localities but it's going to take time and it's going to take selectively like being patient and getting the right parents that have the traits that you desire and then you know breeding them together it, it, it's like it, it's like how it, it's looking like it 
it's like people want to all everybody wants to do jungles black and yellow yeah they're already established you just take black and yellow and make black black and yellow and eric and i constantly are like man why is nobody taking like inlands and using them and making them there's like one guy that's doing that it's tim tindall and it's like his are phenomenal why isn't anybody else doing it and it's like well because you have to take 10 years 12 years it's like you guys have said with the with the pop one carpet like like you could you could easily make a a screaming yellow and black yeah it um, it's gonna take time it's gonna take multiple multiple generations to do it but yeah you could create so many different looks from those you could you know what's easier Buying jungles. a black and yellow jungle. <laughs> Buying two black and yellow jungles and yeah. making yeah. more black and yellow jungles. Yes. Yeah. So here's a question for you. If you do get, say the line is the same, but you get a yellow neonate and you establish a blue project from the yellow neonate, even though it say would trace back to some of those lines from the from the early days, is it still the same thing? Yeah, I I, I would say it is. It, if it, it is it, okay. It has, so I, I have I have a a blue line animal in my collection that is a yellow neonate that I plan on taking it back to other blue line animals that gotcha. are yellow neonates to to just chase that project more. Right. Now, okay. The, the unfortunate thing is I I can say yeah it's totally possible and everything but unfortunately just no one's really done it a whole lot and so we don't have a whole lot of like substantial evidence to look back on and, and do it but if if red neos can do it what's what's stopping the yellow neos from from doing the same thing i would hope that the younger generation of herpers that are coming up now are i feel like we sort of got locked into things that were in the past i i you were I, earlier when you guys were talking something just popped into my head when we were when we do the herp history thing and i talk to people from the past it's kind of like we think that like sometimes these things that some of the founders did you know were like really strategically done mm-hmm. like you know like oh i have this master plan and it's all coming together whereas yeah so a lot of times maybe that's not the case yeah, and they, maybe they were just trying dudes. stuff. Yeah, maybe you know? they were just dudes who liked reptiles and, right. and you know made made something happen. You know, and I feel or, like I I feel like it, I guess it's getting pushed. I see it with keeping right, right. You see it sort of like this. I mean, I think for me and Owen, the book we just read, that Secret Social Lives of Reptiles, really like made me have to take a was step back. Blowing my sort brain, of like yeah. Have to like really assess my understanding of reptiles and how they work, right? So like, um, I'm hoping to see more things like that to where people will push themselves out of these boxes that we've sort of made over, say, the past 30 years in, in herpticulture, and and try to push those boundaries. And I think a lot of times like older keepers, old school keepers will give some pushback. Like, you know, you think about the whole, like, uh, well, you kept it this way. Yeah. Well, just because you did it for years doesn't mean that there's not a better way. And you know, Mm -hmm. that's a whole nother thing when it comes to keeping chondros, that is a whole nother. (laughs) Not even just like, not even just like, Hey, let's, let's push the boundaries of the ways that we're keeping it. But I, I think for me, especially, it, I I love the observations of what's happening, and so yeah. I, mm-hmm. I keep I keep detailed records. I, Eric, I know you keep detailed records, and so one of the things that that has been like blowing my mind recently is it it's an observation that I made in my collection over over years, and I don't I don't pretend to think that I'm the first person that has you know discovered this and you know i i will go sure. down in history as this you know put my flag in the in the yeah, moon uh, i figured it out yeah but it, it's recently come to the discussion in in a lot of the you know the chondro stuff is when when a female chondro is about to ovulate okay so she's been with the male she's she's breeding she's growing follicles and then she's about to have that huge ovulation. Mm-hmm. I have noticed that my males, the specifically only the male that bred her, sheds 
at almost the exact same time that she ovulates. Really? And, and so it's, it's something that like, like clockwork, it happens every time in my collection. When, yep. when I have two animals that are paired and they, you know, they're interested in each other. And then all of a sudden the female starts swelling and they start losing interest. And I see that male starting to go blue. Mm-hmm. Like he's going into shed. I'm like, great. Ovulation's coming. He did it. Be- it because it's become that regular. And I, I feel like that's one of the things where we pay that's so awesome. much attention to the females Mm-hmm. during during the breeding and we just chuck males in and you know where no one really was paying attention to what the males were doing and, and the routines that maybe the males had that were also being like key you know key things key steps along the way that that we just didn't pay attention to right so I, I would i would ask the carpet community like is is that something that you guys have noticed and because we bring it up in, in green tree stuff and then all of a sudden people are like oh my gosh my male shed on the exact same day she ovulated my male shed two days before she ovulated and it, it's there are exceptions it doesn't happen to everyone every time but it it seems to be this thing and now we're looking at it going why is that like what right what yeah. does that play in nature and you know, is it a uh, is the male like shedding near the female to basically like put a put a, a flag near Back her? Back off, and, yeah. Hey, mm-hmm. awesome. other, other males don't even bother because yeah. I got the job done. And, and so, I I would be really curious to see if that's something that happens mm. with other Morelia, and if the males shed in sync with a female ovulation so are those Hmm. together still or are they separated at that point i separate them so the pair is separate and even still even she'll ovulate and he'll shed literally every Hmm. at least in in my collection that's what it happened and i've I've posed the question to other other green tree keepers and they like majority of people say Hmm. oh yeah that does happen but it's because we, it, my point in saying all that isn't to pat myself on the back and say, look how brilliant I am. <laughs> Even though I clearly am. Clearly. A little clearly bit. Right. Uh, what was the, what was the <laughs> shirt that we designed in the last episode? It was like, <laughs> yeah. you know. I, I have Condros, therefore I'm better than you. I'm better than yeah. you, yes. I have con- <laughs> yeah. I keep Condros, therefore I am better than you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Th- that'll I'm, be in the I'm Teespring store is, this summer. Right. <laughs> is very much what you said, Eric. It's, we... I, I hope the future generation continues to make adjustments to husbandry that, mm-hmm. you know, to help us be better, but also to just make observations on the husbandry that we are currently doing that maybe we haven't been paying close attention to because, you know, yeah. there's always something more that we can learn from these animals, even when we don't change anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that's just been a really cool example of that idea um, that I've seen play out recently. Here's a breeding question for you, right? So chondros are bred all year long, right? Yeah. Um, all the time. And, you know, they're, they're not very seasonal, which I guess makes sense to where they come from. There's not a lot of play and temperatures and light cycles and such like that, right? I would I would argue that they're probably geared more towards – pressure drops in the outside and like if you're paying attention to the weather i know owen always makes fun of me but like a uh, lot of the that, moon <laughs> yes. a lot of those outside cycles i think really play a part more so than we think that it does with what's going on in our collections right so that being said is is when you breed uh, like let's just say that uh, you you breed your chondro and it, it breeds in September, and she produces in what would it be November? I guess would be when she would produce a clutch, something like that. Is that consistent? Does she stay on that schedule now, as as what you've seen, or does it is it just all over the place? Where yeah. <laughs> one year she's in August, one year she's in November, the next year she's in March. Yeah. So you're, you're speaking of an individual snake. Will yes. they stay on the same Correct. schedule mm-hmm. year after year? Have you noticed so, that? I guess. Yeah. 
So, yes and no. I, Crap. Unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, chondros are just not typically the animals that are bred year after year back to back. Mm. Most most breeders will you know take take at least at least you know a, a, a hiatus in there somewhere where it's not often that you're going to breed a female in, in December mm-hmm. one year and then December the next year just just because they they take a little longer to to bounce back mm-hmm. um, and so. The majority of breeders, once you find the female's rhythm, are going to be pretty hesitant to change it. break break that rhythm and try something different. Right. Okay. Um, you know, if 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 you have a female that tends to breed in the fall and lays in in you know the winter or early spring, then you know don't don't mess with it. You know because she's she's obviously liking what, what you've lined up. So probably just keep doing what you're doing. And I would say most people do that. Now I I do know Ian Bissell has uh, had females that, you know, go in different months and he, he just looks at his females and says, you know what? I think, I think she looks ready to go. So Mm -hmm. now I will introduce the male and he's had, some success with that. I wouldn't say that it's always a, a successful thing. I'm sure he also has some females that are locked into a certain time of the year. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, so it, it's a yes and no, I, I think. Okay. I tend to uh, take kind of the, the Ryan Young approach of, man, I, I'm going to do my thing in the room and I, I hope that the snakes will start to get in sync with that. Okay. Uh, and now I, I have, so I have a female that is, she's probably a, a month away from laying her first clutch ever. Um, and I've, I've had her for a handful of years and she has been bred like crazy. Like the, it, it, it's not from a shortage of locking. It's not from, uh, you know, the food cycling that I've given her, it's not from the temperature cycling that I've given her because I've given the same thing to all the others. But my guess is the reason why she hasn't gone in previous years Mm -hmm. is because she was on a different cycle than Mm -hmm. my room was. And maybe she wanted to be a summer breeder. Maybe she wanted to be a, a late spring breeder and I, I pair my animals in the fall. And so I, that's my guess is why she took so long to, to come around is she was, she was just still getting on the cycle of my room. Mm -hmm. And because green trees are, you know, rather plastic in their, um, their ability to breed year round. I I think they have tendencies and and desires of, Hey, I kind of want to breed in this season. But if you stay, if you stay consistent with something over and over again, you know, they, they want to reproduce. The right. Animals want to pass on their, their genetic material. And so, sure. um, so I, I, I think you can get a female on your rhythm over time if you stay consistent and, you know, um, just steady with the, with the course. Okay. okay. So um there's something I've talked about with Buddy a couple times, other buddy, um, is the lack the, the, of the poor whipping boy, you mean? <laughs> That's his official title, yes. That's, yeah. Um but he and I have kind of jumped up bounced us off each other a bunch of there not being a very good opening green tree python to start with. Like your options are a wild caught animal off of a flipper table at like, I think four or $500, which the other thing is that they say it's a baby, but the animal that they have is like a, a, a year and a half, two years old. Yeah. Um, Once you've seen a, a baby like that, they're green tree baby, you know, yeah. that the, <laughs> the ones on the tables are not, babies. not, I, I remember seeing the, the first 
green tree python eggs at Buddy Buscemi's house. And I'm like, oh, cool. You got corn snakes. He goes, no. I'm like, oh, my God. Like, it was just that. So, yes. Um, but there seems to be no good entry level green tree python. Like, because we've talked about with carpets, you can find that 60, 70, $80, $100 carpet python to get you started, even if it's a mix to get yeah. your feet wet. With with green trees, it's like it's six, seven hundred bucks, maybe right now for like what uh, uh, imports if they're even coming or it's even higher for uh, yeah, oh, it's higher. Damn. <laughs> or it's a, uh, a a captive born and bred animal for God knows how much. Yeah. Yeah. So you can you can get a, a 10 or 20 dollar green tree uh, and it, it's called a rough green snake. Ah, okay. <laughs> that's you know, why i fucked up with you that you can get them for free just pluck them out of the wild they're everywhere oh yeah they just shove them in a in a aquafina bottle and it's on its way you're yeah. good to go yeah the man the really unfortunate thing it you know obviously it's a double-edged sword is uh that chondras over the last two years you know with with the pandemic and everyone staying from home and, you know, wanting, wanting more exotic pets in their life and mm. all the stuff, the, the market has gone so crazy um, where even, even the imports now are uh, you, you would be lucky to find a import for six or $700. Wow. Um, most of the ones that I, I see are upwards of seven. Uh, and even, you know, I, I've seen older imports, um, so not like, you know, the, the yearlings that you typically mm-hmm. see, but like ones that, that are accurately sexed, you know, a, a female, uh, import or long-term captive or, you know, mm-hmm. however they're going to label it in, in the thousands range. Wow. Um, and, and it, and they're not trying to hide anything. They, they are saying, Hey, this animal has no lineage. It has no mm-hmm. documentation. It's a female, it's $1,200. And you're like, geez, that's insane. And so it, man, it really is super unfortunate that there aren't entry level chondros anymore, mm-hmm. um, it, at least for the price point. Um, and I, I do think that that is it, it. It just is deterring people from getting into them. Like, yeah, you, they're not. Not everyone can go drop a thousand dollars on a snake, especially if it's going to be riddled with parasites and just die a week later. Yeah. Um, and so it, it is super unfortunate. Now the flip side of that coin is man, green trees are a really, they can be and have a reputation to be a really hard baby to establish. Mm -hmm. And based on the man hours that go into getting those, you know, those snakes established, and, and the, the blood, sweat, and tears that you put into this snake to get ready to sell it, not mm-hmm. to mention the decades of documentation that you have on this snake and how it got here and the story and the, the history and all the, the people you know throughout those decades that have helped to get this snake long. Mm-hmm. A lot of people would say that chondros have been underpriced in the past, and man, now maybe – maybe they're getting more accurately priced mm-hmm. based on the work, the, you know, the, just the time that's been put into them. Um, and so it, it's so tricky. And, you know, there's, when there's money on the table, everything gets, gets harder, gets yeah. more convoluted. And, you know, it, it's just a, a hard thing. I, I wish that there were less expensive still you know reputable green trees because i like buying green trees like i <laughs> i would like to get more and not go poor yeah <laughs> I, I buy it as much as i am a seller like i enjoy buying green trees and uh and man it, it's just so hard right now uh, do you see that going a different way maybe as things kind of loosen up a little bit or is it going to be one of those things where it might take a while for them to kind of dip back down or are we looking I, I at honestly, them going to Bullen's territory where we're talking 10 grand a snake? <laughs> yeah. And, and that's not out of the question. I mean, yeah. man, I, I've, I've had people offer me crazy amounts of money for some of the holdbacks that I have. Um, and I, it's, it's laugh. I mean, at, at some point you're just like, 
You're scared. No, right? Yeah. Like, like, <laughs> Let me guess. Going to give me I have to go to Western Union to get this payment, yeah. don't I? And like, yeah. and, and you're a prince. <laughs> you're a prince, you say. <laughs> uh, yes. So, so honestly, I, I think it's going to take a long time, and I don't, I don't think it's going to be, an an undercutting of you know of people. I, I think the only thing at this point that's really going to start dropping the price of green tree pythons is more people having success with them and and there's right now there's just too high of a demand mm -hmm. and not enough inventory green tree pythons you know for for better or for worse they're just still not a species that we have really cracked the code on yeah on you know keeping and breeding and, and successfully establishing back into the hobby where you know ball pythons, corn snakes, even carpet pythons to a certain extent, you can really follow the recipe that has been laid out and have success reproducing that species and getting it back into the market relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. Where green trees, it, it's just not that way. And so even even though there's some people that consistently have clutches year after year, uh, if you took their recipe for breeding and tried to plug it into your situation, you may or may not have the same success. And yeah. so they're, they're just, I, I think we're getting closer to, mm -hmm. to kind of putting the pieces of the puzzle there to crack that code. Um, but until there's more animals in the market, I don't think those prices are going to drop down because yeah. Every step along the way gets harder for breeding. You know, it, putting them putting them together is easy. Getting locks, it doesn't always happen, but it's pretty easy. Getting an ovulation and having the female not die, that's a little harder. Getting eggs, man, right now, if you go on Facebook groups and Instagram, you see a lot of people getting eggs. Mm -hmm. and, and that's awesome. But I guarantee in two months, when those eggs are supposed to be hatching, you're going to see a lot less people actually posting that they have hatched green trees yeah. because so many of those eggs are going to go bad because incubation with green trees is super tricky. sucks. Yeah. And then even the people that hatch them, you know, you have to establish them. You have to get them ready to sell, which can be so frustrating. So yeah. Hard. And, and so man, every, every step you take along the ladder, it just gets harder and harder. And until there's more people in the market that have figured it out and are putting out more animals into the market, I just don't see that price dropping. I see them in the blackhead territory, right? I think mm -hmm. I think that they're there and they're going to stay in that that I think they're they're going to follow the same trend as blackheads, right? Because I think blackheads are a similar niche of snake, right? They're not they're not the hardest to breed, right? But mm -hmm. like to get them to produce consistently, I can think of what Jason Hood maybe is the only yeah, okay. one in the yeah. U.S. that's really like uh, Derek Roddy, a Derek Roddy, of course, yeah. Mm -hmm. no. But these there's there's two people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. it's not to say that other people don't bleed, breed blackheads, but yeah. I think well, to there's, the a, level, there's a guy in uh, there's a guy in Texas that does it too. Yeah, um, what's his name? Sand, sandstone reptile sand. He's got. Phenomenal, but or phenomenal. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard of it. Yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I can't but, remember the name, but I know you're talking about. Yeah. The only the only differentiation I, I would put in there is obviously green trees. Like we are, we are still adding to the pop the captive population of green trees mm -hmm. through importation from from Papua, where you know obviously we're not getting any more blackheads. You know they're they're not coming over from Australia. No. So, well. I mean, some yeah, somehow yeah. end up some somehow end up in like uh, Europe, but we uh, that's different. That's natural right, migration. <laughs> you're gonna get the other buddy slap if you keep it up. With your conspiracy theories Don't make me hit you. Yeah, <laughs> um, but okay. I, I, I agree with oh, that. Yeah, I, I agree I'm, that it's just gonna be that way. But it 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 just sucks because. I mean, I remember the first snake that I spent over a thousand dollars on. It was not my first snake. Wait, <laughs> yeah. is yeah, sure. is it 
is that a good thing in that maybe a con well i'm not against chondro being your first snake right i I think this idea that somehow like you have to have x amount of time under your belt in order to be able to be successful with that is just nonsense because i would argue i've talked to you know oh and you and i over the past 11 years have talked to some of the i mean we talked to rico walder for christ's sake you know what i mean so like I, I mean, and somehow I'm not able to. You know, oh, I, yeah. But all right. <laughs> I, I'll admit it. The whole point is that certain snakes we kind of deem as not good beginner snakes is because they are not as forgiving as other snakes. And because well, I, when I say it's not a beginner snake is because I'm trying to set whoever's no, no, no. buying yeah, the yeah, animal yeah. up for success. I totally, I, but I totally could you do it? Saying. Fuck yeah, Absolutely. you could. <laughs> I, I guess it. my point is, is that you could really do your research. You could yes. really talk to people. You could. You could really be excited Ooh. about a species, and you could just make that your first snake. Right. However, that, all that being said, right, um, is it is it the best for the animal? If mm. that person, is, if somebody's able to just go out and buy – I mean, I don't know. I think about all those imports that have come in and I think of all the people that buy them in a reptile show because they can't afford the thousand dollar captive born and bred and they buy that animal and they're just not equipped. That's where I would say Mm. they're not equipped to probably take on what you're about, what you think you're about to take on because- to establish that animal, to get that animal hydrated, you really have to have a good understanding of, of snakes and doing. how they work. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's not like you can just be like, oh, I want to get a snake. Let me look. Do, 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 do. Dude, oh, but, look. That, but that's <laughs> the thing that happens. Because how many people, like how many dealers bring in truckloads of Savannah monitor and Nile monitor? Like this is not a green tree right. python thing. This happens. Yeah. And I would say – most of the people are even less equipped to deal with animals like that. And I yeah. would say, I would argue yeah. that and those, they're cheaper. They're 45 those, bucks. Those <laughs> wild caught animals should be making their way into a lot of the collections. Right. Of the of people the who can establish them. Green tree people who could turn around and establish those animals and then produce from those animals right. captive born and bred entry level chondros that maybe are 500 bucks. Right. You know, uh, so, something well, like here, that. Here's the, the, my, my response to this question. I, I, I do get it all the time. Uh, mm. You know, is, is a green tree python a, a good first snake. Hey, I, I've never kept them, but I, man, I'm so infatuated by them. I, I get messages on the Texas Condros Instagram account daily. Okay. Of, hey, can can I have this? Can like what? How do I how do I care for this? And I my answer is always, you know, kind of the the same the same song and dance of man. It it really has nothing to do with the animals. Like the, the species that we, you know, we have, there are some hardy species. There are some harder to keep species. There's some species that you can, you can keep and breed with your eyes closed. Mm-hmm. And there are, there are species that, you know, if you look at them wrong, they kill over and die. Right. But ultimately it doesn't come down to the animals. I, I think it comes down to us knowing ourselves as keepers. Mm-hmm. And so for me, I am a very, detailed person like i i love doing the research i i enjoy that i want to learn about not only the you know the natural history of green tree pythons man i want to learn about the lineage of these snakes i i oh and in the same way that you geek out on the story of rough scale pythons and how they got to america and the fact that you have one in in your collection you have multiple in your collection. Um, <laughs> I geek out on on the the history of the the animals in my collection and the other keepers that have that have had animals in their pedigree. And man, that's yeah. so fascinating to me. And yeah, I I wouldn't do well with snakes that that you keep in in drawers. I I, I probably wouldn't do well with with ball pythons or blood pythons or, you know, something that needs to be left alone kind of and not, 
not, you know, stared at. Cause man, I love walking into my snake room, looking at all the animals, doing the inspection, listening to see what I, I can hear and, and, you know, smelling everything. Like I, I want to take in all of it, but that's me as a person. Mm -hmm. And if you're not like that, that doesn't make you a bad keeper. That just might mean that a species like green tree pythons isn't for you. Yeah. There's, there's tons of species that I think are fascinating. I, there's monitor species that I would love to keep, but because I know myself, <laughs> no, <laughs> likely not going to keep them anytime yeah. in the near future. <laughs> but, but we, you know, I think we put these badges of honor on certain animals of, Hey, well, once you, once you reach the level of super keeper, then you can have emerald tree boas and green tree pythons and right. bolus pythons. And, right. and I, I don't think it comes down to that at all. I think green trees can make phenomenal fur snakes mm-hmm. because they are so low maintenance. Once you, have them <laughs> Once you get it right. set right the way. Yeah. Man, they, they are completely fine being out in the open on display. Like, man, I, I think they make great fur snakes if you are the person that should be keeping a green tree python. Mm -hmm. Uh, And if you're not, that doesn't mean that you're, you know, you're less than me, although obviously you are. Um, (laughs) As as the shirt will say, yes. Um, But it, it just means that, man, there is a species for you that, that is going to thrive better under your care. If Mm -hmm. you know yourself and and the energy, the the time, the you know, whatever that you are willing to put into that species. I Mark, could go with that. Mark, you ever had a a, a a nasty green tree python, one that like hates your guts? Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm, and, I'm... and eventually, it uh, did it did it fix it or it, did it learn it to love down. you? Uh, yeah. Well, I, I I'm it, having it became, my. I, I would say it became. Uh, more it, it, it became less annoyed by me. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm starting to. I have, um, I've had my first interactions with a rough scale python that absolutely despises me, which is a problem because I want to get right up on that cage and check it out. And yeah, then it comes time, flying man. with this fate. And I'm like, okay, that's so, yeah, yeah, okay. I'm going to ask the last question, and we didn't talk about this necessarily on the first go around. Oh, yeah, okay. Oh, wait, Um, I haven't prepared for this. uh, Too late. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And then Owen can ask his closing questions, and uh, we can go. Um, But the the question that I'll pose is like this: this this popped into my head when you were talking about we haven't cracked the code with chondros per se. Yeah, and I think one of the I don't, it's not necessarily, it's not, a, it doesn't, a, it's not that it, I don't want to say this like now I'm being elite, but like, I, it's not that I'm annoyed by the idea. It's a man right? of Condro but, already. I mean, He's in the elite club. But, I mean, he should what have I don't understand. <laughs> what I don't understand is like with Condros and, and maybe this has changed and I, I don't know. We wonder why we have all these problems with females when they breed and they die and all these crazy things that happen. But Mm -hmm. let's be honest. We keep them too freaking fat, man. (laughs) I I would say, I mean, we keep them too big. This was something Owen and I are guilty of this when it comes to carpets. Right. But I think, I don't know what changed, but we caught on to that quick and we like changed it to where it's like, well, we read in a book that the coastal carpet should be 12 feet long. Well, one, that doesn't mean one, one that you went. feed it until yeah. <laughs> you grow it to 12 feet long. It could like, be. Yeah. How did we, how do we translate could be correct into should be well, it what should is the be. normal size yeah. of a, of a green tree. Right. And you think about right. this and like, you look at the papers and you look at these things and you're looking at like what a three I mean, they, to 400 gram the, the male. Simple. There's the second smallest genus of pythons. Right. So like, how? There's, there's Antaresia, yeah. and then there's green trees. Like, so they, how, in heaven's name, yeah. can the chondro people that are like the most dialed in 
with their animals to, to what you just said in the last statement about how, like, if you're not somebody that goes into the room and watches all these things and you're looking at details and you're paying attention to these little, little cues that these snakes can be giving off is sort of like the mindset of a chondro keeper. At least that's how I perceive it. Right. To your yeah. point, I think that you sort of have to have a mindset that way in order to keep that type of species. Whereas like, you know, to your point with a ball python, you probably leave it in a drawer and call it a day and everything is going to be grand. Um, so why has that changed? Has that shifted to people keeping smaller? Has it, it starting to, has it, has, is this just like, screw you, we're going to have 1200 gram snakes and it is what it is. And when they die and they drop dead, we're just going to sit here with scratching our head like monkeys do. Like what is going on here? I don't understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say, yes, it has definitely changed. Good. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I, I would say I, I've seen it changing through most of the reptile industry, you know, with, yes. we're, we've typically, we keep things too hot. Mm -hmm. We feed things too often yep. yes. and we hold them too much. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, with, uh, and maybe just, bother them too much because yes. we also we move too much we change things you know whatever um but, but between keeping them too hot feeding them too much and bothering them too often i i feel that across the industry and also in the green tree um, hobby that we are taking a step back to keep things cooler to feed them less to to you know, realize that these huge obese females uh, that don't live very long, like why, huh? Why do our snakes not get into, you know, their, their teens, their twenties. Yeah. Ever? yeah. Like yeah. It, it's probably because we're killing them with fatty liver disease, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and so, uh, yes, it, it is a trend in green trees that we are, we are keeping cooler we are feeding less. Um, I I have I have a female. Uh, I had a female uh, that was. I, I waited until she was six years old, and I I fed her as you know as regimented as, as I could, but tried to get bigger meals in her. I tried to put you know some weight on her in preparation for breeding. Sure. Six mm -hmm. years old, she was four hundred and fifty grams. That, wow. I mean, that's, that's probably the right size, right? Yeah. That's small. That's yeah. real. That's, <laughs> that's dangerously small. 450 grams. And she produced seven eggs for me. Right. Now she yeah. was upon laying those eggs. Looked she horrible. Was mm, yeah. 200 and like, I had to look at my notes, but like 220 grams or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. she looked awful she looked like an extension cord they always I mean, do yes. <laughs> yeah. you know right, yeah so would i would i recommend people uh you know keeping their chondro super small in order to know mm -hmm. but if if you're you know i i think i think having a of age healthy bodied female that is smaller you are going to have more success, especially in the long term, rather than your, you know, thousand, twelve hundred right. gram females that spit out thirty eggs and then die the next year. Right. Um, I think of Matt Somerville. Right. He posted up a picture. I think it was over this summer, the last summer. Um, but basically, the picture he posted up, he had a, some species of brown snake, mm -hmm. and he fed it like two mice. <laughs> Two mice. Yeah, yeah, two. I remember this. <laughs> maybe it was four, maybe, but the the number of mice were like crazy low for the year. Single yeah. digits, yeah. The snake dies, it opens it up, full of fat deposits. Yeah. So here's another thing that the I see the carpet python world sort of a, adopting and running with, and maybe this is maybe we influence this. Maybe that's a possibility, right? Because. Mm -hmm. Bill and Buddy are on vacation. Three hundred. Yeah, I mean, three hundred and sixty-four yeah, we're, days. Of we're the, year. the best you have, which is terrible. That yeah, we started to mess with things with varied diet. We're trying to 
push the envelope of, of understanding yeah. these more. And I got to tell you, man, that the last thing I did with Owen with birds, dude, my carpets like devoured them. They were like, bird? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, if you ever have a, a reptile that's like, I don't want to eat, show it a bird. <laughs> like, and they will change their tune. Yeah. And, you know, I'm thinking, like, you know, could that play a part in these things? Has anybody sort of I, like, I think the, the next evolution with, with green tree diet is mm -hmm. likely going to come from how are we feeding the babies? Yes. Okay. Um, because, you know, even from um, all the field research, it, it appears that the adults are primarily rodent feeders. Yeah. And so, you know, to, yeah. to give them the, the rodents, I actually, so I, I have chickens and every yeah. now and then they, they lay like really small eggs. Um, and so out of curiosity, I, I tried to put it in the rhino rat. Uh, I, I tried to put one in the rhino rat enclosure. Was not interested. Did not okay. eat the egg. And then I was like, okay, well, I have another one. I'll put it in a green tree enclosure and no interest. Like okay. didn't, didn't sniff it, didn't care. So uh, I, there, there is a, a, a pretty solid predisposition for adult chondros to eat rodents. And I think that's going to remain the same. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But as we've seen with so many other species, it's like how often would a baby snake ever, ever come across a nest of um, neonates, yeah, um, rodents. They old <laughs> yeah. kinky mice. Yeah. Probably never. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think I think there is going to be some um some evolution in green tree keeping and, and in other species that you know are are similar. I, I think we will see in the next, you know, however many years that we we shy away less from feeding alternative prey sources as, as babies and juveniles, because, you know, we, we've been lied to, to say, if you start them on, on this, yes. they're never going to transfer yep. the rodents. That so like, same thing yeah. with carp. That's, that's yeah. what they do in, in the wild. Like, yep. yeah. you know, I, I promise you green tree pythons in the wild, they're eating, Lizards, skinks, frogs, they're probably eating insects. Yeah. It, you know, Wasn't it, there a study done where they did they did see a, a, a young green tree eating a moth or something like that? Oh, I'm sure. I, I mean, yeah, I think about, I read that you know, in a it, paper. It's, it's perching near flowers waiting, you know, for, for something. Yeah. Something to come by. And absolutely, a butterfly, a moth, like I protein's protein, right? Yeah. I mean, for sure. Um, so I, I can I can see the the you know evolution of dietary needs in green tree pythons going down that that path of how are we feeding and establishing and, and growing up these young babies that we have um i wonder and this is going to go way out there and then we can but i wonder if like you know how in human beings that epigenetic is did i say that right epigenetic i have no idea is that what i'm thinking so like there's this idea that if you're grandmother uh, had poor nutrition her grandchild no matter what they do are going to be jacked so like i mean maybe yeah so i'm sure travis will let me know how wrong he probably I will um, that i just made but what i'm thinking is is like so there's a couple things i'm thinking one mm -hmm. what they're being fed as babies is it somehow affecting them as adults it, it like totally meaning can. that like if you're feeding it something that it normally wouldn't come across or let's say a fattier prey source than what they would normally take in are, is that going to affect them as adults? I, I would say un yeah. undoubtedly. Yes. Like, yeah. it, you know, it, it, it's affecting their metabolism, how, how their body is, you know, programmed to break down food. I, I'm not a scientist. I just, I, we just play one. I I play one on radio. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, and, and so, but I, you know, I also think we can, we can sometimes get ahead of ourselves when yeah. we, when we start thinking about snakes and other animals as humans. Right. And we're like, well, if you feed, if you feed a kid, 
cheeseburgers their whole life, then, you know, they're going to, you know, they, you know, it, it's just not the same. I'm with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Human, I, you know, human yeah. anatomy and, and 100%. is going to be different. But right. I I would say, yeah, it, it, it absolutely has. But if it's specifically X. supposed to feed on X and we're yeah. feeding it Y. Yeah. Now, are, does are that those, have are a detrimental are they Correct. you know are, right. are they minuscule to where you know yeah it, maybe it, it means nothing something but right. it, but it just doesn't it doesn't amount to much um, i guess my thinking in that would be is like it seems like at least my thought would be like if i was trying to figure out like you know females dying prolapse these 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 conditions that seem to come with that can't really put your finger on what's causing these things, right? I know that prolapse is really more a hydration issue and stuff like that. Okay, fair enough. But like sometimes it may come into food uh, or prey, uh, whatever they're eating or whatever. But um, I don't know. I just, I, I wonder, I would think about it in terms of what they're eating as an adult, right? Currently, because that's yeah. when they may have that. Well, at least with my experience, that's when it had that prolapse, right? So I'm thinking like, well, why is the prey item too big? Is it this? But at that age, they're probably, to your point, feeding on the wild. They're probably, they're doing probably similar to what carpets, Antaresia, all these, you know, Indo Austro pythons do, right? As, as babies, yeah. they eat skinks and they eat frogs, um, possibly, you know, uh, insects at some point, maybe, whatever. I mean, you know, but as they mature, then they move into a more, mammal based diet. I yeah. um, unfortunately, you know, I, I just the hardest part about figuring any of this out is there's there's no one breeding tiny skinks and geckos yeah in, feeders. in huge quantities for them to become feeders. And right. the the rodent industry within the reptile hobby is it's such a turnkey thing where, man, I, I, I click, I click, put, put in my cart and then mm -hmm. frozen road and show up at my door. Sure. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Yeah. I might have to work a little harder to get, get the babies to eat, but I don't know where to find skinks and lizards and everything for, you know, <laughs> yeah. for right. my, my 12 green tree pythons that I need to feed. Right. So uh, it, I don't... it's, it's going to be a really hard thing to ever um, break, break the industry. Off, you know, I think it's probably easier with carpets because, again, maybe we influence this. But like every time I find a carpet eating something weird, I'm Throw posting it up that on picture yeah. or I'm talking about it on NPR. I mean, yeah. you know, we had a picture of them eating eggs. <laughs> like they're eating yeah. eggs. They went into a chicken coop and ate the eggs. That's what the yeah. carpet. Not the not the chicken, the eggs, which. I would never think in a million years that a carpet python would eat eggs. I'll give it a shot next time. I had to, one of my carpets eat a tilapia fillet last week. So, um, see that to me, a, that's weird because they would never come across a fish, but it, it, I mean, who knows? But <laughs> my thing is that I always think it's, even if they're not feeding them what they would naturally get in the wild, I think it's not that we're feeding them something different. It's the amount of times that we're feeding them. So, even if they're mainly a snake that only eats bird, even if I fed it bird, but if I fed it a bird every seven days or something like that, that's when the snake's going to get fat. It's compound yeah. that with this is a bird eating snake. And now I'm feeding a rodent every seven days. Of course, it's going to get huge. It's going to get fat and it's going to be dead at it like before 10. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like the, I think less feeding, but it, man if they'll eat something fuck it give it to them <laughs> like at this point i yeah. am i'm going for the the road of least resistance whatever you want to eat cool i will get it for you and i will get yeah. it for you every 14 days if you're a baby um yeah that's it hmm. i don't know good yeah. stuff man cool I, Great I, stuff. I i enjoyed that conversation find, find me uh find me a, a skink breeder and, I uh, mean, that's an untapped market that I think we should just kind of build a little niche out of, of making wonderful little geckos. It's and not a skinks. million dollar idea, but it, it's it a hundred dollar idea. It might be a hundred dollar <laughs> idea. <laughs> just the amount of time and effort you have to put into this. Yeah. <laughs> 
That may be uh, Eric does it for his snakes. Yeah. <laughs> and nobody else's snakes. Jesus. I do have a couple skinks floating around back here. <laughs> you cannot feed blue tongues to a well, you could. I don't know why you do it, but oh, you can't yeah. feed it to a chondro. No, I but think no, no, blue no, tongue baby will. will probably eat, eat the, the chondro. <laughs> Just well, that backfired. So yeah. all, all right. right, go ahead, Owen. All right, I guess we're on the final questions now. Again. Oh, are we gonna do are we gonna do same ones or different ones? I'll, I'm week? gonna roll it. We'll see if it's different. Um, I think we should get Owen one of those like things where it's just like you know, it a wheel it up and just then spin it. Now <laughs> the question. Okay. And landed on. He's studying. Mm, He's studying. Yeah, it's. Hmm. All right. What is one thing that you know now that you wish you knew when you started keeping reptiles? What is one thing I know? I know, I know lots of things now, <laughs> but I didn't. But I didn't know then. Uh, reptile specific things. That's uh, that's different. Um, you know, I, I, I hope, I hope that there's, there's never like a time when I'm not learning something new all the time. Like, mm-hmm. man, I, I'm just. I am so programmed that way where I, I want the knowledge. And yeah. so, you know, if, if I go, if I go mm-hmm. a, a couple of weeks without learning something new about green trees, I'm, I'm going to go search for it. And, mm. and like I have to track it down. And I, I'm sure that sounds crazy to some people where they're like, what are you talking about? Like, just be content. But mm-hmm. man, I, I am just programmed that way to, I, I think, thirst for that next piece of knowledge that cool like tidbit of information that's going to blow my mind and hmm. oh man so uh yeah i don't know it, everything everything i i know i know nothing and everything <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a green tree python breeder i am eternal it's like okay <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, all right. If you could, what is one piece of advice that you could give to the reptile community? Uh, man, I, again, I would say, I would say do, do your, do yourself and your future animals a favor and do some introspection on yourself. Like find out who you are as a keeper, as, you know, a responsible human before you start going into, you know, different species. I think, I think we, we oftentimes play that game of like, Oh, well, y'all try this species out (laughs) and, you know, keep it for X amount of time only to find out that it wasn't for us. And then we get rid of it and, you know, it goes on to someone else and we pass it along and, uh, Man, I, I think if if we just did a little bit more introspection and like self discovery, then we would, you know, looking back as after having kept some of those animals, it's like, of course that animal wasn't for me. Like, <laughs> why did I ever think I would be, you know, happy keeping that animal? Mm-hmm. Once once I realize, oh yeah, well I. I travel all the time or I, I pay no attention to my animals. And Mm -hmm. so I, I I think my piece of advice would be, man, do your research on your animals for sure before you get them, but also do your research on yourself and figure out like, man, who am I? And, and what am I programmed to really love and care for well Mm -hmm. before I start getting into stuff? Okay. Cool. And uh, what is one species you regretted passing on? Yeah, we talked about this last time. Yeah. Uh, the the diamond pythons are are probably my biggest regret passing on. Yes. Um, I I was I was offered uh, a diamond python for like 250, 300 bucks. Dear God. Uh, back <laughs> in the day, and I was like, no. I want a I want a jungle carpet. <laughs> and, and man, I regret that. I, yeah. I I loved the jungle carpet. Like it it was great too, but man, I I would kill to have, you know, just 
of even just one. Like I, I don't, I don't need to breed them. I don't, you know, whatever. But just to have a big, beautiful diamond python, like mm-hmm. man, for me, it's hard to beat a a beautiful diamond python. And I, I want, I want black and white. Yes. I, the, yeah. the black and white diamonds. I'm like, ooh, man, sign me up. Thank God, Eric hasn't produced any yet. Like, thank <laughs> God, I am. I, like it is. It, it. I get in trouble. I get this close to gelatin jungles every time I'm over there. If there were baby diamond pythons near me, mm-mm, mm-mm, dude, they're done. They're the best. Yeah, they, no, I, dude, I, 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 I'm sure I will have them one day. Um, but yeah, huge, huge regret not getting in to the diamond game early. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I'm establishing a new snake room here in my office. So, you know, this is, I, <laughs> I might have plenty room, of room man. for them. It's a cold though, groom. There you go. It, it like is it. not. They're right over there. And that's, yeah. yeah, no. So, all right. That's all I got. So, uh, Eric, you can do the things and other well, stuff. Well, how can people get in touch with you, Mark? I know you do uh, Texas Condros on Instagram. So give a little shout out to that and what's the whole idea there. Yeah, absolutely. So, it, you know, if you want to message me, you can message me on Instagram at Texas Condros. You can find me on Facebook. I'm, I'm on Facebook uh, as well. Uh, the whole idea behind Texas Condros is, man, I, I wanted to help promote the other people in Texas that are keeping the amazing species that I love. So mm-hmm. the Texas Condros Instagram account is d- this collaboration between a, a ton of Texas keepers uh and, you know, I, I've been really, really fortunate to um, just kind of spearhead that and help help promote amazing people who are keeping amazing snakes. Um, so you can you can find me on there. You can message me on there. Uh, if you want to see my personal collection, you can go to texascondros.com, uh, spell out Texas, and uh, and you'll you'll find me there. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I, I'm pretty easy to get a hold of outside of that. Cool. Cool. Um, well, I'm glad that the two worlds of Morelia can be at peace again. Once again, and all be joined right in, in harmony. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and, well, and, and if we do this for a third time next week, then, you know, we'll really <laughs> then it will be really good. Yeah. Really be yeah. ingrained in us. Yeah. Or will it go backwards? I, I don't know. It's I really the I, balancing I don't know. act. I can't speak for Owen, but I, I do appreciate this talk because Chondros for me have always been one of those snakes that just have just eluded me. Like I want them, but I, I I'm just afraid to pull that trigger. Right. And like yeah. when I do talk, I'm, I'm glad that we could have uh, an honest conversation and look at some of the things that maybe we, uh, or look at it in different perspective, I guess. You know what I mean? So sort of be open-minded to to the discussion. And I think that yeah. uh, that's the one thing I love about the whole entire Morelia world, both sides. It's like we're really just passionate about trying to figure out what makes these snakes tick, right? Whether it's carpets or chondros, it's just, you know, like we think we want to learn everything we possibly can about mm. them, right? Yeah, I don't absolutely. I don't and man, like, it, it, you know, it's... It goes without saying that, you know, you can't you can't enjoy one species of, of Morelia without being able to appreciate all of them. Like they're oh, yeah. all yeah. phenomenal. Now, yeah. obviously, green trees are the elite of. Whoa, now I mean of all the just, Morelia. Uh, superior, <laughs> superior, some might they're say. They're not. They're not keeled, and they don't have a threat display. Can't do it. <laughs> yeah. All three of us have a different ideas of what the superior, <laughs> superior, superior Moralia is. But so there okay, is no, enough. so there will be no peace. Oh, Got we're it. still in peace. <laughs> Damn it. <Uh-oh. laughs> but with our um, powers combined, bye. we yes. are Captain Moralia. I think, I think uh, I will make the pledge on the NPR now to have more, because we really haven't done a whole lot of Condro shows. and We're supposed to have their own podcast for it. Well, clearly <laughs> they've been slacking off. The ball. Right. I, if I, only I, there were two people who had started hmm, a Condro hmm, podcast. If hmm. only there was. We don't know where the, they are, though. Well, yeah. I guess they fell to the podcast shame, curse, right? Shame. You take a week off, and then it's just and then it's three years downhill. later. Yeah. <laughs> so 
Why don't we ever have that? (laughs) Right. Doesn't matter. We keep going, Owen. (laughs) Like that Energizer bunny. We record Thursday. (laughs) Uh, If you want to get in touch with us, MoreliaPythonRadio.com is our website. And the email is info at MoreliaPythonRadio.com. Um, and, uh, yeah, you can check us out on Facebook, uh, on Instagram, NPR network is all what it's under. You can check out our, well, I would advise you to please check out our YouTube channel, uh, yes. NPR network. Um, we do all the podcasts are uploaded there and we do live carpets and coffee, sometimes live NPR, uh, there as well. So I think that's everything. You can check out uh, all the different podcasts on the network. I think there's 12 now. I'm not sure, but we're not going to count. There could be 13. It's too late to count. <laughs> yeah, an, um, an hour went by. There could have we could have added one and not known. And yeah, yes, they're um, breeding. Yeah, <laughs> yeah just exactly. Uh, Self reliant now. <laughs> uh, what else? What else? Um, Teespring so, store. Yeah, Teespring store, Patreon, all that stuff. Um, which, do them. By, by the way, we have to do that when I come back from San Diego. So yeah, yeah I'll I'm, be off in San Diego next week. Dick. Uh, Herpin, <laughs> that happened. I was able to get a ticket. So um, I, I, yeah. I, I hope you find a shit ton of things. I hope you have a great time. I hope you stub your toe, something awful on a table while you're out there. So yeah. Thanks pal. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Much appreciated. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, that's all I got. So I guess close this out. Oh, I guess that's all we have for you guys this week. We promise we'll next time we have Mark back, there will be some time that has passed in between shows <laughs> <laughs> or he'll be back next week. We don't know. So, um, thanks everybody for listening, but we'll catch everybody next time for some more Morelia Python radio. Good night.